Hey now, it's Mike Gilbert, host of the Mike and JD Show, right here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. Join JD by God Oliva and myself every Thursday night live on the Voices of Wrestling YouTube channel at 11.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time as we stay up all night discussing all the hottest stories in professional wrestling. You can also check us out right here on the Voices of Wrestling podcasting feed or you can subscribe to the Mike and JD Show feed. Now, enjoy the show. This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. Hey there, Thunder Buddies and Travelers Down Thunder Road. It's us, Days of Thunder, the WCW Thunder rewatch podcast that you didn't ask for, but we did anyway, coming as part of the Voices of Wrestling podcast network and powered by a large man appears.com. It's me, your host, your frequent flyer on Thunder Road, Dave Ryan. I'm joined, as I am every week, by my faithful co host, he's Stagger Lee Malone. Lee, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm uh, happy to be back on uh, our regular scheduled episodes this week um, yes I feel, I feel i know we all we always say this it feels like a while since we've done a regular show but mm. i think over the given what happened last weekend it just feels like it's been a long time since we've done a regular show it feels like we fit about four weeks into the two weeks since the last uh regular thunder program that's mm. for sure um but it's been good. We had our, our little trip over for All In 2024, uh, getting to do our, our, our near annual uh, rib of we only spend time with each other outside of the country. Um, <laughs> but it was it was quite a joyous weekend, I feel. It really was. It was quite, a, quite an enjoyable weekend. Um, we got to meet up with a lot of people that we wouldn't see regularly. Um, yeah. Friends of the show, like, Kieran and Mark from Mussy Matches, yes, uh, and uh, and the Disc World Order, Mark's new project, which I, I yes. want to plug here. Um, the infamous Scarlet Kidney was in attendance. The infamous, yes, infamous Scarlet Kidney, our good buddy, who we actually had the fortune of running into multiple times uh, over the weekend. We deliberately spent like uh, a couple of different occasions with him, and then. Literally almost as if we summoned him, we were sitting in the airport on Monday and I text him and pretty much as soon as the ping delivered, he walked past us <laughs> having in a very like something out of a like idiots in a rom-com. He was like eating at the opposite end of the same restaurant to us. Yes. Um, yeah, it was like Garrett Kidney was to Joe Hendry of our weekend to say his name and he appeared. Yeah, very much, um, very much. But yeah, no, that was that was a welcome addition to our weekend. Obviously, um, we also had Jack, who probably won't hear this. And <laughs> but this is the section he does listen to. Oh, this is so the this section is, he does listen yeah, to. Yeah, this is right. the bit where you ham up that it was an unwelcome uh, addition for you. Well, look, the Londoner didn't get us lost in London this year, so he didn't. To be fair, friend of the show, Keep Brownie as well, the designer yes, of the Days of Thunder Keep graphic. Brownie, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Mr. Emoji himself. Mr. Emoji, yeah. Um, yeah, no, it was a good weekend. We also met uh, one Joey of this parish as well. Oh, we did, yes, that's correct. Yes. Yeah, Jesus, maybe forgot Joey. Yeah. Um, who, who obviously filled in on the show a couple of times while I was off last year. Yeah, he certainly did. Um, it was nice to finally get to meet him in person. I've only known him a couple of years through this site, whereas you've known him donkey's years, and this was your still your yeah. first in person meeting with him. First in person meeting, thanks to uh, Fuzzy. Yeah, God knows yeah. If, if Fuzzy had not showed up on that show, we might have never met. So, 
Although you've never seen two human beings move quicker than Joey and Lee when they had left and they heard the <laughs> flatline gimmick before Hook's entrance and ran back in. Yeah, to the point that Joey nearly fell up the steps. So, yeah, that, yeah. that was a good moment. Uh, but, yeah, no, look, Lond- London was a great weekend. It always is when we get to spend a bit of time over there and uh, get to have a weekend together, having a laugh, eating good food, mm-hmm. having good drinks. Yeah. And I, I won't be partaking in it for another two years because I'll be getting married the, the shortly after uh, Forbidden Door takes to London next year. No, uh, ne- like, next summer. Next summer we're actually going to meet up in Ireland. Yes, we are. Yeah, for for my my wedding, it takes getting married to get Lee to come and meet you. It's disgraceful, isn't it? Isn't it funny that your your actual your wedding is going to be like less than thirty minutes from my house? Yeah, you actually have the shortest commute of just about anybody going yes, to that wedding. It's great. Which would be funny when you just say, "No, sorry, I'm busy." <laughs> Gotta wash my hair. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, should be a good time. Also, I guess um, because I, I wasn't expecting it to go public so soon, and to, well, not ex- expecting, but I wasn't. I didn't have it in my head that I'd be talking about it in the podcast so soon. But I guess because it did go public, that's a better way of phrasing it. Uh, it's just uh, time to acknowledge that uh, for the the second time in the history of this podcast, there will be a baby of thunder as uh, I'm going to be a father for the first time you early are. next year. That that would look that was that was the best news of uh, all in weekends to be honest. Yeah, when you when yeah. you broke in your face, me, Brian Danielson, <laughs> <laughs> in my quite exhausted state on Friday evening. Um, yeah, to get that news was like a really great way to start the weekend. So congratulations you, about yourself and Emma. You had a very good reaction of like we were sitting over. I had finally gotten out to the hotel, which was a fucking arduous process to get from the hotel I had been staying in to the hotel we were both going to be staying in once you arrived. Opposite, complete opposite ends of London. Yes. And um, I finally got there. You were exhausted. I was exhausted, but I had insisted that we sit for a, an alcoholic beverage so that I could tell you the news, unbeknownst to yourself. Mm. Um, and I told you, and your immediate one was your immediate reaction was like. No way. <laughs> <laughs> it was the classic, like, get right out of town. <laughs> well, I did tell you, like, I, I told you this, so I'll tell the listeners that uh, on the Wednesday evening, or Thursday evening, it could have even been, when I was packing my bags, my wife had said to me, oh, is, is Dave leaving his pregnant wife at home, or wife-to-be at home? I was like, she's not pregnant. Unless you're telling me something, like you're foreshadowing something. And it turned out she was. Yeah, Jen like, has the inside track at, a, at our maternity <laughs> hospital, apparently. She's getting all the scoops. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, that, that was a great way to start again. But yeah, like yeah. I say, congratulations to yourselves. And I look forward to the birth of young Stevie Ray Ryan. Yes. I've had a number of people suggest things, uh, WCW-related uh, gimmicks for my child. Uh, I appreciate one and all. Uh, again, be... uh, Alex Berlin is also another possible name that could go yes. both male and female. Yeah. Um, I, I'll tell you what, what is going to be what is going to be interesting is the process of documenting WCW with child. That's going to be... That's going to be a good time because much like uh, yourself, when when you were blessed with a child during the running of this podcast, mm. this podcast ain't going anywhere. We commit. No. We are <laughs> seeing this fucking thing out <laughs> one way or the other. Um, so, like, doesn't matter if I'm up doing nights. It doesn't matter what's going on. Uh, we will, by hook or by crook, get this yeah. podcast done. We may just have to bulk record over the early 2025 <laughs> period so that my paternity leave is covered when yeah, I'm at look, stations. We, we will not be going anywhere no matter what yeah. happens through well, all uh, trials and tribulations <laughs> well as we know from your break last year uh, we have any number of ringers who will step in to watch one episode maximum of WCW at a time. Uh, l- listen as I've been informed in our discord people are angling for me to be replaced so yeah, let, let's see how happy they are when you get replaced by somebody yeah, but I definitely right now. The problem is, I'll always get called back because when Lee has to start editing the shows, I think there'll be like a oh, frantic. Hey, buddy, when are you coming back? <laughs> <laughs> I actually did mean to get you to show me how to edit while we were together. <laughs> 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 maybe, maybe Kieran will be getting a call going, "Hey, how much will it cost you to edit every show?" <laughs> Kieran, charge him through the fucking nose for us. Patreon money. Uh, um but yeah that's that's the good news uh let's move into i i think uh our uh 
because you know I gotta I gotta put my baby in pairs of shoes eventually. Yes. Uh, so we gotta hawk uh, what we've got going on over at largemanappears.com the Days of Thunder Patreon. So what have we got coming up for September 2024, Lee? I just want to say it's not just shoes that obviously you will be requiring. It's also you know aqua wear because as we know, as we discovered over the weekend, you will of course be getting a boat. I will. Yes, this is yeah. we are pushing hard to uh, for Emma to get me a boat. Yes, um, she is not appreciating already that she has been text by friend of the show Jack about like, <laughs> get get that man a boat. <laughs> You deserve it, Dave. You you absolutely deserve a boat. But anyway, coming up at largemanappears.com this week, this coming week, we will have another TRL. Um, it's a TRL by our good friend Matthew, who's requested, I can't even remember how many shows at this point, but this one is Talk and Shop at Mania 2, 3? One, I thought. One? I, I don't know. One of them. It's one of them, but um, yes. We will definitely talk- watch the right one. It's a talk and shop in Mania that took place over COVID. Um, so, obviously, it's all your faves, like Sex Ferguson and that other dude that they play. <laughs> it's the long pause there that really <laughs> sold it for me. Uh, look, I'm not a talk and shop guy, but I will do anything for this Patreon. So, of <laughs> yeah. course, I will be dialed I- in. As has been noted, Lee will do almost anything for money. Yes, that is true. Um so yeah, we'll have Talk and Shop and Mania coming to the Patreon this week. And then later in the month, we will be, re- be returning to one of my favourites that we do. It is the Rehash of the Champions, and we will be doing Clash of the Champions 11, Coastal yes. Crush. Uh, would you like to hear the card for that show, Lee? I would, because as we discussed in our off-show, off-air production meeting, I have not looked at this card since the last Clash of the Champions show we Kay. did. Now, something we learned over the last clash or two is that the the card on cage match doesn't necessarily fully reflect the televised card. Mm. Uh, sometimes things are moved around and things are missing. But still, with that in mind, um, what is listed on cage match for uh, clash eleven is fabulous freebirds versus the Southern Boys. Okay, we have Bam Bam Bigelow versus Tommy Rich. We have Mike Rotunda and the Z-Man versus the Samoan SWAT team. We have Fly and Brian versus Mean Mark. Cool. <laughs> we, <laughs> we have an NWA United States tag team title match, the Midnight Express versus the Rock and Roll Express. We have a singles match, Doug Furness versus Barry Windham. We have a United States heavyweight title match with Lex Luger versus Sid Vicious. We have an NWA World Tag Team title match as Doom take on the Steiner Brothers. Uh, we then have Paul Orndorff versus Aaron Anderson. And in our main event for the NWA World's Heavyweight title, Ric Flair will wrestle the Junkyard Dog. Good Lord. So, as always, quite the mixed bag. Mm-hmm. Um, something that you will you will learn in depth uh, if you come over to alargemanappears.com is that... Uh, these clashes, people have a lot of rose-tinted glasses about how great oh, yeah. the clashes were. Uh, I think we talked in an early show about how people rightfully pillory those AEW Battle of the Belt shows, saying that like mm-hmm. they don't stack them at all. But people say they don't stack them like they used to stack Clash of the Champions. And boy, is that a myth. Um, <laughs> people misremember just how many squash matches and like just bad matches overly long 15 to 20 minute matches that were involving undercard yeah. acts yeah like for every flair versus funk there's 20 god fucking awful matches uh to like h- h- how many mike rotunda tv matches do you feel like you've watched so far i think he is the most capped wrestler on the first 10 clashes i feel like he's been on every single mm-hmm. one and, and how, many, how many of the matches were good? Matches. No, none of them. <laughs> zero. Precisely zero. In fact, it was but a yeah. clash so bad, I remember that his match was bad, but it was still arguably the best show on the card. <laughs> so, if that's what you want to hear this month, so that's what that's what we'll have later in the month. But yeah, so they're the two shows. And we will also obviously have a solo audio. Yes, yeah, solo audio this returns month. this month with me. Um, I do apologise, as outlined and I think the last Thunder... Uh, it's been a nightmare with how god awful 
current day wrestling has been mm-hmm. and uh, how little of it we've got the chance to watch over the summer uh, that we really haven't well, had much for obvious reasons the, yes yeah i mean yeah i think it's a bit on. clearer now why i've been quite busy for yes. approximately the last 12 weeks um <laughs> stressing and freaking out so uh-huh. uh yeah i will return i actually have watched because i set homework from the last one uh, is that i have my uh all japan triple crown comp and i have watched the first four matches uh of that so we we're going to be talking about those matches some current day wrestling um and doing some q a uh for sure as well so you can check all that out. Um, you go over to largemanappears.com. It's only five euro a month. You get all that. You also get the premium podcast feed that contains these very shows as well. So it's all kind of nice and streamlined for you over there in one feed. If you're somebody that doesn't like to have multiple feeds, this is an option for you uh, for five euro. Uh, we also have the 15 euro tier, which is uh, our TRL tier, where you get to request uh, any show, as Matteo and many others have done. We're coming close to the end of the third season of um, of TRL, where we'll take a, a brief break to do some other things and let some requests pile up and then go ahead with season four. Um, but get your requests in and we will always get to them as soon as possible. Uh, also, as Lee likes to point out when he does these plugs, we do have a one euro tier. If we you're do. somebody that you're maybe not in the financial position right now to back us at a five euro level and get your... Uh, two to three podcasts a month uh, bonus and the complete archives you can just throw a euro two euro our way uh, as a kind of thank you for what we're doing here on the free feed and we very much appreciate that Uh, something actually Lee that we we did mean to say um, that we were alerted of by Patreon just before the last Patreon show if you are a Patreon subscriber Please, I, I'm like the Patreon told us what to say to people, but I think I'm going to do it a different way and just say, don't use the iOS Patreon app. No, don't. Because they are starting to charge you more uh, for your subscription uh, than you are trying to pay. So what I would do is if you're an iOS user, just log on to Patreon on your browser on Safari and subscribe through there copy and paste your rss feed that you should get through an email or through your uh, benefits section on your patreon page copy that into your um your apple podcast app or whatever um and that way you can circumvent uh, alternatively stop buying apple products because they stink (laughs) (laughs) yes yeah look yeah, you're got, you've got heat with lazel on that one uh he's a big apple guy Uh, ah of course he is that that makes a ton of sense I can say this now because I won't see him for a year, so it's fine. Yes, yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, let's move on. Slightly sad news uh, mm. before we get into 1999. It would be remiss of us not to mark um, two deaths of WCW wrestlers since last we spoke on this program. Um, the first is Viano5, who I was kind of surprised was only 62 years old when he died. I thought you were really going to dig into the bit there and say you were really surprised he wasn't, in fact, Viano 4. No, no. <laughs> um, but yeah, no. All... Oh, I, sorry. I was just going to say, yeah, no, he incredibly young, considering, um, like, that would mean he was in his early 30s in WCW. And when yeah. you think of how little that the Vianos were used, it's yeah. kind of shocking. Like, like, you would think of them as kind of older guys at that point because the Viano gimmick mm-hmm. had been around so long. Yes. Uh, I think it's interesting. Um, all the articles I've read, like, so CMLL posted this news um, just before the weekend. Mm. And um, what I, I thought was interesting was them saying that, like, if you're just an American fan exclusively, uh, you just remember them from, like, where we're analyzing them in WCW, where they're essentially, like, even within the bounds of the luchadors, they're job guys. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, I can't tell you offhandedly the last time I saw a Viano pick up a pinfall victory or if I ever have seen it Mm. on a WCW program. Um, It's definitely seldom. Um, But articles and obituaries by people far more learned than us have pointed out that, like, in Mexico, the Vianos are household names. Oh, yeah. The, 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 The Viano family, as it were, are, like, just enormous, enormous names in the history of Lucha. Um, 
the one match that was getting passed around a lot over the weekend or well over the course of the week um is of course the blue panther versus viano 5 mask match yes um an incredible match like just mm. absolutely incredible and i i think it's one of those things where like if you are a younger fan you really don't understand just how big of a deal it was that viano had in fact taken blue panther's mask yeah no for sure a big deal um like it again the the cultural significance of the not only the removal of the mask but like the the honor bestowed on the person who gets to take it Mm -hmm. you know that kind of a thing um it's interesting as well that uh viano worked up until this year of course he did he's it's lucha yeah yeah uh that's like incredible incredible fair play so uh, i i was listening to the flagship this week and uh, i believe that viano five does in fact have some sons that are wrestling currently yes. Um the viano kids that are most well known at the moment are viano trees son so they're viano tree jr and el hijo de viano tree i believe um are the okay. ones currently in cmll right um, okay but yeah, so we we may in fact see some younger Viano fours and fives at some point. Yeah. Um, the other death. I feel this is one that's going to be like, of the two of us, you're you're definitely the the the, the bigger expert in the field. Um, but very sadly, we learned through Facebook last week that we lost Sid Vicious. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a hard one. He had been ill for a little while, seemingly. Um, cancer I believe yeah um, and yeah his son announced that, that he had died um, and this is a real gut punch because we are just obviously right in the middle of really digging this this Sid run in WCW and we'll talk a bit about him on this show and going forward as well but um, like I know for me I kind of, with the time I got into wrestling, like my primary memory of him is as Sean's opponent at the Alamo Dome, which was like, he was fucking great in the run up to that. Um, Just his, like, I still close my eyes and see him, you know, and the cutting the promo in the empty Alamo Dome. Yeah. Um, Just fucking absolutely insane intensity about the man. And then, like, in my childhood memory, you know, these things just kind of slam together and you can't tell, like, what the gap of time is. It's literally, like, I don't remember anything then and he's in WCW for this run. Um, But I always had such a soft spot for Sid. I mean, I'm going to quote the article that, you know, pissed off all of Twitter seeming last week with Rich's Sid is the best bad worker, best bad wrestler, whatever way you want to say it. Yeah. Ever. I I adore Sid. I just you either get it or you don't with regards Sid. And I feel like as as we've all gotten older, I think everyone seems to get more of an appreciation for just what Sid was. And yeah. because there are no wrestlers like Sid anymore, we really do see just how fucking special people like Sid and Vader yeah. and guys like that were to wrestling and how how much they added. Yeah, for sure. I mean, for like you, you mentioned the Alamo Dome, like the Sid entrance at MSG for Survivor yeah. Series '96, like the fist bumping. My my son had never seen it before, and like he he's seen the fucking nearly every WWF pay per view at this point, yeah. um, and even he was just like, damn, like and like the the light up Sid behind him, and yeah, god damn, like just. But I'm this, I... go on, go on. sorry. Uh, Okay. Uh, no, it was just, it was that kind of thing. Like it, with the article, like I, I remember we had the bit when he debuted that you kind of chided me because like I said about how he sucks, like, but like he, he was great because of the ways in which he sucked. Like, mm-hmm. do you know what I mean? He was great because, and this is one of my favorite things about professional wrestling is, um, I can't remember who it was, whether it was, Alvarez or Meltzer or someone like that back in the day just on a podcast was just like pro wrestling is the art of taking the biggest human being you've ever seen whether he could wrestle or not 
and getting him over as the best wrestler in the world. And if you could do that, that is that's pro wrestling at its essence. Mm-hmm. And Sid was one of the best big men in the history of the business. Was he going to wrestle, like, take you down to the mat and razzle you? Is he going to do a Bret Hart match? You know what I mean? Like... No, he's not going to do that. Is he Brian Danielson? No, he's not. But I don't want him to be. There's already those wrestlers. Like, what you want is a, a mix of those technical guys who are going to give you absolute, like, banger matches but you also want the aura guys Mm -hmm. that coming in and just doing pure power moves guys the guys who just like have these wild crazy brawls you don't know what they're gonna do you know guys who like even if they're not great on the microphone either get their message across through their intensity or have such incredible like we literally just talked about the i have half the brain you do like these immortal even if they're not for the ways in which he intended them to be immortal. It's like, I'll never forget so much of Sid's career for like, many, many years. We're, we're live, pal. That's Sid. You know, yeah. that, like, he he just added so much to pro wrestling. And for so many years, people shit on Sid. And but it, and, and I think I think a lot of that was because the post WCW era was the rise of like Ring of Honor and stuff like that. Like mm-hmm. work rate became the watchword of a yeah. generation. Mm-hmm. And I think if that's the only metric you're using, it's easy to lose Sid in that because yeah. like he's not that guy at all. He doesn't measure up. It's all the other stuff around that that Sid's special at. That like it, that a lot of that work rate generation couldn't replicate. Yeah. That like no, no you know, like a hundred percent like maybe there's two or three people that came up in that kind of American indie scene that could even get close to the level of physical charisma that Sid yeah. possessed, or um, that kind of like genuinely terrifying members of audiences or children like that kind mm-hmm. of Brody energy of like if Sid came into the crowd you were fucking out of there. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I I always t- like I've talked about it on the show before. Like I went to a WCW house show in. 92 maybe and like was terrified of Vader 92 or 93 whatever it was and like absolutely terrified of Vader yeah. and that's that's like a lost thing in wrestling yeah and well it's, it, it's not just wrestling it, it, it's you know culture it's overall pop culture yeah, yeah, it, yeah. it really pop is culture, and the, the, the strings behind how everything works in pop culture are too overexposed now the kind of the, the magic or you know um, or the suspension of disbelief is all gone because now we can all, at the click of a mouse, see how the sausage is made. Yeah, and, and that's in sad. 1992. You couldn't you couldn't find out that like Vader was just a normal dude with like money invested in real estate. Yeah, you, uh, like, you, you didn't realize that Vader was just a dude that was really massive yeah. and like fucking softly spoken. But um, now the other the other thing about Sid was the Sid being a maniac thing was sometimes not so much of a work. Uh, no. which helped a lot <laughs> like uh-huh. you, you know this is the thing is like there were you know there are countless stories about how like this was a crazy intense guy mm-hmm. and it made him hard to deal with sometimes but I mean I never had to book him so I don't care I just care about what the end product was on my television and the end product was a guy who like undeniably was a massive star and we will talk about Later on, he is getting cheered over the company's top homegrown star of mm-hmm. the, of this era, um, because but he const- was special. It constantly happened, like anywhere Sid went, he ended up as a baby face because fans just loved Sid. You couldn't book him as a prolonged heel because yeah. he was just he was too fucking cool. And like he's a guy that went out chokeslam, powerbomb, big boot. Like he didn't have a ton of moves, but he didn't need a ton of moves. Uh, oh god I just I wish there was somebody in wrestling in 2024 as fucking great at being Sid as Sid was well this, I, I had tweeted on um, Wednesday night it's like just fucking give Big Bill the Sid push he already was wrestling in jeans up to a few months ago get him away from Jericho put the jeans and the Tims back on him give him a leather waistcoat and just have him fucking <laughs> powerbomb dudes every week have him come out to China wife <laughs> yeah fucking <laughs> Man, he'll get over like fuck. Um, oh god, but, yeah, no. Sid, Sid is like 
we'll talk about it eventually when we get to it at the end of our Thunder run with the injury and stuff. But so sad that yeah. that was basically the end yeah. of Sid and wrestling. Yeah. Uh, like he did mount a little bit of a comeback, but it just wasn't. Mm-hmm. It was whatever he had physically was was kind of gone by then. Uh, I'm glad he I'm glad he got that one comeback on Raw, like that little Heat Slater segment where people went little, fucking nuts for him. Yeah, with myself included at home. Yeah. Um, but he's one of those guys where you know they often say that like you're never really truly forgotten until the last person stops talking about you mm-hmm. and i think it's safe to say that people will be talking about sid for a long time not only people of our generation who actively remember him in the ring living through it but i think he's going to be one of those guys that the younger generations the the one and sadly there's diminishing amounts of them in the younger generation that look at loads of tape of old stuff but i feel like the ones who do when they, there's going to be people uncovering sid losing their fucking minds over him because of just how cool the guy is and how like he's just one of the great things about the iconic stars of wrestlers it's just people you would never see in the wild mm-hmm. no one in the world looked like sid vicious no you know <laughs> like no one um and yeah he he will be remembered for a long long time and rightfully so i I actually i I was listening to i'll I'll plug um the podcast well also the flagship did a great uh obit on uh sid this week and rob rob naylor and chris ellner did an episode of exile abroad battery on the between the sheets um podcasts feed and they did a great like two two and a half hour show all about sid's career but I was listening to that while Connor was in the car with me and they were talking about the skyscrapers and yes. how Danny Spivey and well and Sid were the skyscrapers and Connor was like, Oh, do I know Dan Spivey? I was like, Well, yeah, Whale of Mercy. He's like, Oh, okay, I didn't know that was him. And he was like, Oh, is he I sick? love that your son recognized Whale and Mercy by I know, yeah. <laughs> he he just does. But um He's like, oh, was, he was he was six eight. I was like, yeah, I was like, he was six seven, six eight at his tallest. And he was like, all right, that's not that tall. I was like, Connor, I said, huh? if you saw somebody that was six eight, they would be the tallest person you've ever seen by yeah. a long distance. I said, you, because they're next to such, you know, tall people as well, like other tall people, you don't realize it's the whole Billy yeah. Gunn thing. Yeah. But uh, yeah, God, I, I'm going to miss it. Yeah, that's a big one for you. Like, yeah. you've always been the like, I love Sid, but you love Sid. So that's a, that's a tough one. Also, and we'll get to it on this show. Sid was fucking awesome on this show. Sid was fucking awesome on this show, and like, uh, that's the one thing that gives us solace is that pretty much for the next two years of podcast, and we still have Sid. We still have Sid. Yeah, yeah, we still have Sid on the regular. Um, so we can look forward to that. Much as unfortunately, like. In terms of booking, it's uh, whew. we still have Sid though physically, yeah. even if the booking is wanting at best of times. Right, let's move on to the show. It is WCW Mayhem, the first of its kind, from Toronto, Ontario, Canada, the twenty-first of November, nineteen ninety-nine, getting two hundred thousand buys which is not the lowest of the year. But when you think that Uncensored 1999 was 325,000 buys, and Uncensored is usually a historically bad performance. The worst of the year, yeah. Like, I could make it even worse and go, you know, Super Brawl 9 this year was 485,000 buys. I mean... That was February... For some nine fall. months, yeah, some fall. Nine months, months. That's that's more than a fifty percent cut. Yeah. Um. The other thing I can tell you is that uh, at two hundred thousand buys, it sounds dire. And even though I said that is not the worst uh, one of the year, do you want it? Do you want a, a stat that'll cut through your heart to tell you what we're about to go through? Go for. 
from now till the end of WCW, 200,000. This is the highest pay-per-view of all the pay-per-views that's left in terms Oof. of buys. Ouch. Nothing for the entire rest of the history of this company gets within 50,000 buys of that. What? Yes. Ah, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I knew it was bad, but Jesus Christ. Yeah. So by um by like spring of 2000, we have multiple pay-per-views that are doing under 100,000. Yeah, sad, it's, sad man, sad. It's real fucking bad. Like from, again, you want to go to a year-on-year comparison. Um, let's go to what would have been the World War Three would have been the November pay per view last year. Mm-hmm. So that did two hundred and fifty thousand. But as you remember, World War Three last year was a really bad. Oh yeah, that was, was really bad. Show. They never got around to building Bam Bam and Goldberg. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> where the newspapers were mad because they hadn't told them what was on the show. Mm-hmm. Um, there was one of those. There was a couple of pay-per-views like that, but that was one of them. Uh, but I think the Starcade to Starcade is usually the one I use as a comp. So Starcade last year was 460,000 buys. Starcade next month does 145,000 buys. Jesus. Mm-mm. Not good. <laughs> That's like a sixty percent drop year on year. Not good. Yeah, yeah. So just to kind of frame where we're gonna be at. Um That said, we'll get into it. It's not my least favorite WCW pay per view of all time. No, no. Um, the tournament recap does the opening video. I think something that has been strong about this month is that they had two big ideas. They had the Sid Goldberg match and they had the end of the tournament. And these were, they spent all month pointing you at these things. Mm -hmm. And I think if this was a year ago and they had two strong ideas that they push relentlessly for a month like this, I think this is doing around the 500,000 buy range. Um, I think the 200,000 is partly a symptom of how fucking cold the product is now. Oh, yeah, 100%. Like, I I don't, I I can't really, like, I mean, look, there are things on the TV, as we talked about all month, that have been dog shit. But in terms of them making it very clear why the pay-per-view is important, I can't necessarily fault what they did there. They legit, like, brought in a new pay-per-view name to say this is, like, it's a tournament. And it's, you know, we're going to have the crowning moment. Like, this was their King of the Ring, or their... We know what Russo was doing. It was their Survivor Series fucking deadly game. Mm -hmm. But, like, yeah, you can't fault that they they had these two things that they were going to use to draw on pay-per-view. And the fact that they didn't draw, I don't think is an indictment of Sid Goldberg or or the tournament itself. Yeah, I think it's just... The product is fucking dead. Now, that said, the tournament was fucking bullshit. <laughs> there was yeah. so much fucking bullshit in that tournament. Yeah. But I I don't think, like, the final four, I think they got to a good final four. So I, I may not have liked how they got there, but they did get to a good final four, I think. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, Tony notes that this is the first WCW pay-per-view in Canada, which is mental. Fucking insane. Uh, like, Canada is such a hotbed and they could have cashed in on a huge show at like any point during the boom and just left Canada to the WWF basically. Hulk Hogan was drawing tens of thousands to Toronto and fucking other parts of Canada for a decade plus before he ever went to WCW and he's been there since 1994. Not only that, but even if you don't include that, something that I was very much reminded of on this show for obvious reasons is Bret Hart's been here for two years. Yep. You could have done at any stage during that two years when he wasn't hurt. And even when he was hurt, you could have, like, just gone to Canada anyway with, like, Jericho, Benoit. You could have still had Bret appearing on the show in, like, a referee or an enforcer gimmick or something like that. Brett, and it was Brett, so like fucking gangbusters. Brett came in December 97. The fact that they didn't have a pay-per-view in Canada in like March or April of 98 is fucking like yeah. 
just shows this company, man. And, and also, even if you don't have those Canadian stars, like fucking wrestling is hot in Canada. And their first time in the market was going to be huge, regardless of who was on the show. So you could have just gone in, even if you didn't have those guys, and then come back with those guys. Um, absolutely, yeah, fucking insane. Fucking insane. Money left on the table. Um, as the guys are running down the card, I was incredibly distracted by uh, a very animated fan mean mugging in the background because he was on TV. Mm -hmm. um, there are some very obnoxious fans on this show. Um, our first title, they get straight into it. It's uh, it's Double J versus Chris Benoit, and this is the uh, the full Days of Thunder debut of the Chica Chica Bwah Bwah Bwah. The one depth. of the all time now we still don't have the ch -ch chosen one yet but like we're nearly there folks the, the definitely not Kid Rock's cowboy song yeah 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 yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I, I, lo look, I love this music I, it's great I love it iconic latter day WCW theme um, I'm sorry Garrett I do prefer it to my world even though my world got one of the undisputed biggest pops at Wembley <laughs> Like, outside of Final Countdown and Seek and Destroy, my world probably got the biggest pop of the night. Ah, no, Nigel. Nigel was ahead. Oh, Nigel as well. Yeah, Nigel yeah. as well. So it was in the top four to five pops of the whole show. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I look, I'll, without getting too much into the match, I thought this match was damn good. Like, I thought this was a really good match. And it goes to show, like, I, I think people are, are quick to trash Jeff. And I think Jeff is always the guy. We've said before, uh, we buy into the Garrett Kidney theory that the further Jeff is from the world title, the more entertaining he is. He's mm -hmm. only an obnoxious, horrible presence when he's hogging the main events, as he's about to Yes, uh, in WCW. But... Um, he can still have a very good match with the... Now, it has to be the right person. I don't think Jeff is going out there having knockdown drag outs with just anybody. I don't think he's at that level. But I think he's he can have a very good match with the right people. But I don't think this was necessarily just because he's in there with the right person in Benoit. And this is the start of what will be many Benoit versus Jarrett matches. I believe they have a whole feud on Nitro over the next month or so. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I loved about this match is they wrestled like they were in a tournament and they wanted to get the win as quickly as possible. They yeah, wrestled yeah, They wrestled to the match they were in. They weren't trying to have a great match. Yeah. They were going for like big stuff really early to finish. Like the, the commentators are putting over like these guys are going to have to wrestle twice tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're like, we don't even know when the final is going to be. But because this match is happening first, maybe the guy who wins this gets more time to rest. Uh, tournament logic, you know, we love it when it's actually uh, paid attention to. And they like Tony, I'd say again, I thought Tony had a really good night here. People talk about how disengaged yep. he was in the product. I thought he was good here tonight. Um, he brings it up very early in the match. He's like, oh, well, isn't this just perfect that, you know, the chosen one is coming out first on the show so he can get as much rest before the title match. Just, you know, again, favoritism shown towards Jeff Jarrett. And, um, yeah, I, I just, I really, really enjoyed this. Do you think they could have stretched out a bit more that, I think there could have been a lot of uh, hay gotten from maybe a couple of months of lots of things coincidentally working out for Jeff, but Jeff denying that he was getting the invisible hand helping him the whole time and do the plausible deniability thing. And then like right at the moment where he like becomes the guy, like gets the belt, I think is the moment where he reveals like he was in on it all along himself. Like if you th I think if you have things like the creative control guys, which, who I wouldn't have had at all anyway, but if you, if you have them coming out, but he's like, do you remember like Brett was trying to sell like he had no idea that mm -hmm. people were interfering in his matches, and you could have him pleading innocent this whole time and have the crowd being like, I think he's fucking up to something. I think you could have gotten a is, bit of storytelling and a bit of heat out of that. Isn't that just The Rock as the corporate champion? Yeah, but that is what they're redoing here. They're yeah, I know, I know it is. It. Yeah. 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 But um, also, in your version of events, we would never have had Vince Russo on TV, so it wouldn't have worked. No, it would have. But it no, it would have. have but, like, it wouldn't have worked for Russo, yeah. Who definitely didn't want to be on TV. No, 
Absolutely not. Definitely doesn't appear like fucking Dr. Claw on this show anyway. Um, people are big into Benoit in this crowd, uh, mm-hmm. obviously. Uh, spills outside, Jeff gets the heat. Uh, hits a lovely power slam and a yep. stalling vertical for two. Uh, pin reversals off a sunset flip from Benoit. Uh, Benoit makes a comeback. Jeff takes a backbreaker directly onto his arsehole. I, I um, love that backbreaker. It was like a Roddy Strong style backbreaker. Yeah. Really yeah, good. The real messiah of the backbreaker, mm-hmm. Jeff Jarrett. Um, or sorry, Be- Chris Benoit. Yeah. Um, Germans, uh, creative control, amble out. Like these two dudes look like they're fucking blown up. Can, like, can I first suggest appearance on the show? Can I suggest a new name for creative control? Go on. Will we get away with calling them the SS? <laughs> I think they. I think if they could have gotten away with that, they would have. Which tells me that we can't get away with it because I'm sure they they pitched it. <laughs> don't tell. Don't ask me why, but I just have this feeling that they would have pitched something like that. It's like they have some sort of personal branding on them that uh, that would have uh, helped with that. Anyway, um. So, yeah, they come out. Benoit gets hung up on the rope and falls to the outside. Uh, Creative Control try to insist that the referee counts him out. Uh, Jeff goes out to break out. Th- yeah, this is, he. Jeff comes out to break up the count out, which I thought made no sense to me. Like, he could have just waited. Like, if you're trying to get heat on him being, like, the cowardly heel that needs assistance, like, him just trying to take the count out probably plays into that a bit better than him, like, valiantly going out and going, no, I'm going to beat him. Uh, Benoit rolls him up for two near falls um, suplex headbutt uh, creative control grab his leg before the pin it's just very funny to me that these guys are called Patrick and Gerald uh, the most transparent we're doing uh, Patterson and Briscoe thing in the world um, there's just like there's no, it's just a subtlety hammer it is a subtlety hammer left right and centre we haven't even gotten to Oklahoma yet on this show No, nope. this company and particularly the head writer. This man has a fucking complex about the company he just left. Like, he cannot get over talking about the company he just left. Well, it's because he was never the most powerful Vince in that company, that's why. No. But that's the thing. It's like, it's not like this guy was fired in disgrace. Do you know, I get him having a chip on his shoulder and wanting to take shots if he had, like, been fired in disgrace from the job and felt he was unjustly treated. But, like, he walked because he didn't want to work as much. I was just going to say, he felt like he he was being asked to work too much, and that's why he has this chip on his shoulder. Yeah. Uh, one of the guys distracts the ref. The other beats down Benoit. Uh, Dustin Rhodes comes out of the stands, breaks up the pin after the stroke, brawls with creative control. Guitar gets into the ring. Benoit stops him, whomps him with the guitar, um, and folds him up for the win. Uh, right after the bell, creative control immediately beat down Benoit. I was kind of disappointed later in the night in Benoit. I thought that he would have sold this beat down a bit more. Um, like come out in the DDP rib tape or some shit. But he didn't really. Like until I read this, I had forgotten that this happened. To be fair, it was uh, a bullshit but, beat down. It was literally just putting yeah. boots on. I will say in the, again, you, you always have to give deference to when an angle happens even if we're not into it this did generate great heat on Jeff Jarrett yeah they Um, were fucking fuming in this crowd also Jeff Jarrett gets busted open hard way and as we know accidental blood is always the best type of blood yeah like right on the like the the, the yeah right on the crown yeah 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 I thought it was like chunks of balsa wood were stuck in his hair at first until I saw it like start to trickle down his face and I was like oh my god that's really bad um, Tanay backstage uh, asks Disco does he feel that the money he might win tonight is more important than the belt Disco starts musing on how much the belt could be worth if he sold it when Creative Control and Jeff wander in and beat the shite out of him which I strongly encourage <laughs> this leads us into the next match which is for the Cruiserweight title it's Disco Inferno with Tony Marinara versus Evan Courageous uh, the corpse of Disco stumbles out with Tony and Evan jumps him on the ramp. I love that, like, Tony comes out and the idea is Tony's coming out with a vested interest in Disco winning but uh, so that he can pay him back. But, like, Tony is walking down beside Disco and he just stares on as Evan jumps him on the ramp and begins to beat the shite out of him. Well, no, I don't think his vested interest is that Disco wins. It's that Disco pays. He doesn't care if he wins or loses. Well, because he's winning the money if he wins, so that he'd be able to give him money. 
but whether he wins or loses, he's going to give that money. I think that I think that I think that's how it works with the um, <coughs> Italian American people. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the bell rings while they're still out on the ramp for no reason. Just completely like, we are absolutely destroying all the established unspoken rules of professional wrestling that like if there's a crowd brawl, the bell do- isn't supposed to ring until they get into the ring and make contact. Mm-hmm. Um, the bell rings like immediately when they're on the ramp. Okay. Uh, Evan clatters him. So they, they get into the ring and um, Evan whips him into the ropes. Disco comes way too close or Evan jumps way too late, but either way, he hits him with a dropkick very snugly because Disco is too close to him when the feet come up. Uh, Tony is on commentary. Tony Marinara, this is, and he fucking sucks. Yes, he does. A fucking black hole of charisma. He keeps calling Disco Glenn Gilbretti, which is very funny to me. Um... He keeps calling... He said his dad is a mob boss. He keeps yeah. implying he's a mob boss. But instead of calling him the Capo de Tutti Capi, he he called him once, maybe twice, the Coupa de Copa. Yes, he did. Which is either a nightclub or a Mario boss. I can't quite tell. <laughs> That's what I thought as well. It's like, he's scared of Coopas. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was just like, holy fuck. Uh, the match, though... If you can get over Tony Marinara, is all right. A uh, bit rough around the edges, but it's not dreadful. Uh, Disco stops selling the beating within a minute, which made Evan look quite bad. Uh, Evan tries an unusual... So we've seen many times in WCW, it's like a producer tick uh, to do the spot where somebody jumps off the rope with a double axe handle and they get a, like a drop kick to the gut head on. Mm-hmm. Um, this was an unusual one because um, Disco comes off to do the double axe handle to the outside and Evan hits him with like a perpendicular drop kick. So he waits till he almost dies past him and drop kicks him in the ribs, in the side. I was like, that's very unusual looking. Again, either he's fucked the timing on a drop kick for the second time in three minutes or he's trying something a bit different that came off quite wacky. I, th- I think um, you just fucked the timing on the drop kick. Yeah. And I think you're reading far too much into it. Yeah, I'm, well, look, I'm trying, mate. Uh, try for that content. Uh, big boring chant, which I feel is kind of unfair. Like, I don't think it was a boring match. Like I said, I think it was fine. <laughs> Um, Disco out uh, of the ring to crack on with Medusa. He gets slapped. Tony confronts her. Disco accidentally kills Tony with a chair. Uh, springboard crossbody in the ring. And Evan wins the belt and $25,000 of Disco Inferno's money. What did you think of this? I thought the match was shit. Did you? I didn't yeah. think it was. Again, maybe it's just because I have a certain bar very low bar for disco matches and i thought this wasn't the the worst yeah no i i, I, didn't I, think- I was not into it at all i i don't know if it's an evan courageous thing or a disco thing or a combination of them together but i just couldn't get well, it couldn't into be this disco seen as you spent about two years bold face lying to me like you thought he was good look when you're putting disco across the ring from public enemy i'm gonna take disco all the time i'm sorry <laughs> over flyboy rock or rock how dare you um, but yeah, no, I just I don't know. Maybe maybe it's the knowledge of knowing where this is all going is fucking driving me mad. But uh, would it shock you to learn that this was not the lowest rated match on the show? Uh, it was the there were two matches that or three matches that got this rating for joint second lowest on the show. It wouldn't surprise me. Um, so just to because I, I kind of forget the gimmick sometimes the observer ratings for these matches oh, yeah. uh, our opening match uh, with Jeff and Ben while was three and a half stars this was minus one star which I, I do feel is a bit harsh I, I think, do feel that is a bit harsh I think three and a half is about right for the opener because up until all the interference I thought was trending to be like a really good like almost four star match um, yeah. this one I'm not going to argue with minus one because, again, I thought it fucking stunk, so. I think he's a bit all over the place with a couple of the, a couple of the ratings on this show, but we'll talk about it. Um, 
Brett arrives uh, and Jeff ha- Jeff is being told by Dr. Claw, a.k.a. the powers that be, that he's got the rest of the night to prove himself. Uh, and once again, we're doing the thing where they're trying to build up a mystery of who the powers that be are. By the time they reveal who it is, it is supposed to be built up as a mystery. But like, everybody who goes and meets with the powers that be can clearly see because it's not like he's wearing a hood or anything. He's just sitting in a chair with well, his back to the camera. So you, everybody, you don't know that he's not wearing a hood. This is true, but uh, it's so recognizably Vince Russo that even Jeff calls him a Yankee during this segment. Which, as you'll recall, is what they were calling Russo and Ferrara as those two Yankees from up north. Maybe, maybe he's just wearing a Yankees jersey the whole time, Dave. Again, you're making all he these assumptions. He almost certainly is, Lee. Lee, regardless, he almost certainly is wearing a fucking Yankees jersey. Well, no, he fucking... was not. he's not a Yankees fan, Dave. He's a San Francisco Giants fan. Oh, that's right. That's right. Sorry, I just forget in all the New York of it all. Freaking... God. Anyway... <laughs> I'm just so mad. I'm just so mad, and I haven't even seen his face on TV yet. Um, Uh, Norman in hockey gear backstage trying to put on a brave face, but screams nonetheless. This leads us into the return of the WCW hardcore title, currently vacant, being fought out between Brian Nobbs and Norman Smythe. What do you mean return? This is the first ever official WCW hardcore title. Oh, sorry. The return of the division by coronating the first champion, because they have been bringing back the division slowly over the last month. And now they are crowning a champion, is the the more accurate way to put it. Yes, fair enough. Now, I thought this match was bad. It was. However, I do think there was a couple of funny bits in it. (laughs) I did get, I did stifle two chuckles. Okay, give me your, give me your two chuckles. Okay, so this is like, it's super bad. It's like, it's every fucking garbage brawl you've ever seen. They go to the back. Um, there's, a, there's a bit, it, it wasn't one of my chuckles, but it is kind of funny that Norman is using a steel chair to womp knobs as they go to the back. And then he immediately, you know, kind of, it's in my mind because I saw a 30th anniversary screening of Pulp Fiction this week. And you know the bit where Butch is in the shop and he sees like the baseball bat and he's like, no, no, no. Sees the chainsaw. Mm-hmm. And he's like, yeah, this is much better. And then he looks up and sees the katana and just goes for that instead. So Norman Smiley is backstage and he has the steel chair. And he's like, yeah. And then he looks to his left and he just sees a fucking broom. And for some reason, he's super into the idea of using a broom. Ditches the steel chair for a wooden broom. Um. So uh, where are we? Oh, yeah. Okay. So my first... Uh, my first chuckle is at one point there's stuff flying from off screen and the camera pans to the right and they're in this like little storage area at the back of the arena and Jimmy Hart is standing on one of those stock room ladders that have wheels on them and mm-hmm. he's at the top like hurling cans down on top of Norman <laughs> Smiley I thought that was funny a great bit of camera work but the best part about like, is that none of the food is actually getting near either knobs or, or smiley. No. He's literally just throwing stuff off a pallet and missing them by a mile. Yeah. There's the classic thing that they've done a few times in WCW where guys are no-selling being like slammed on top of gear boxes and into walls and stuff like that. But there's one point where uh, Norman, who has been hit several times with very hard weapons and made no sound in this match gets thrown into a stack of cardboard full of packets of burger buns and begins screaming like he's been thrown into lava Mm -hmm. that wasn't one of my laughs either but that is that is also funny um oh yes they get into a freight elevator they do and my this was my funny bit is that jimmy hart who's like an old man um he goes to give chase to them as they get into the freight elevator and he goes to swing a trash can at Norman Smiley. But the door has all the time in the world to close on Jimmy Hart. So he just hits the door with the can and he just pauses for a second. He's like, ah, fuck. Very patiently presses the button to reopen the lift, lifts the can again and then bonks knobs by accident with the can. That's pretty good comedy. Mm -hmm. That was good. Uh, That was also the finish. Yeah, that was the finish. Norman, who ate, like, multiple trash can and trash can lid shots to the head at the beginning of the match, pins knobs after approximately one trash can lid shot from Jimmy Hart. Yes. 
Jimmy Hart, I tell you, he, he swung for the fences on that one. You have to give it to him. Um, but the, the big story coming out of this match, Dave, is not that Norman is your new hardcore champion. Yeah. It's that Brian Nobbs is no longer in the first family. I know, right? Were you devastated to learn this? Do you also feel like he might be back in the first family within about three weeks? Well, that's also possible, but yeah. it just means we're going to have more Brian Nobbs on the show. This is very true. That's a sad reality, isn't it? Now, here's another one of the ones where I think Dave was out to fucking lunch, right? So, that last match, the disco match, was minus one star. He gave this two stars. That's generous. Like, plus two stars. That's generous. Yeah. This match wasn't yeah, good. Like, do you know what I mean? This wasn't... That's not the way... If you said to me one of those two matches was minus one star, I would have said this one. Because at least you have two guys attempting to have a wrestling match in the last one. Mm. But I suppose you also have to remember, like, the whole comedy plunder thing was new-ish. I mean, look, Dave, as we read in The Observer, thought the fucking debut Oklahoma segment was one of the funniest things he'd seen in years. So that fucking dude, I don't know what the fuck was going on with him in 1999. Um... So, we had a Ray versus Animals package that would convince you that that feud was interesting and good um, and not based on the abduction of women. Um, sorry, Revolution versus Animals. I've written Ray versus Animals, but uh, I, had, I had gone to write a note about how uh, really they should have made this angle about how they took Ray out. And they've just made it about the abduction of women instead. <laughs> yeah, and th- this whole angle is about Tori. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Grant, you get the feeling that, like, on on a night like this, that they really think she's the star of the Filthy Animals. Like, mm-hmm. even over Eddie. Yep. Who, well, to be fair, Eddie's about to fucking split. You can't blame him. Um, We had Tanae. He was with the Revolution. He was concerned about Asia taking on all the animals. Shane Douglas is only worried about Asia possibly killing all of them and not giving the rest of them a chance, which I thought was a good line. Um, although then he immediately turned into creepy he said the thing you should be worried about is when all of us gang up on Tori cool thanks Shane Uh, then Saturn again does that bit of he's super dumb and writing his own promos where he talks about what if the dinosaurs were still alive doing a what if what if thing just not good just not good at all Uh, Gene has a segment with the animals they don't really say anything of substance uh, Disco makes his excuses with Tony who's very unhappy about the results of the match that he could have interfered in but didn't um, Jeff and Creative oh, Control I, I, are wandering around whoa, 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 whoa. you missed the most important part of that Disco and Tony segment I'm certain I didn't but go for it you did <laughs> Tony Mom, Luke or Tony Marinara sorry not Mom, Luke yeah Tony Marinara said he's bringing the boys to Nitro yeah and yeah. you know who the boys are Dave yeah uh Boy 1 and Boy 2 of Dalton Castle fame. No, yeah. it, it is not, in fact, the boys from Dalton Castle's uh, entrance. Let the uh, let the listeners know who we are referring to. That would be one Johnny the Bull Stamboli. Yes. And Famous breaker of ours. <laughs> and our, uh, our fave, Big Vito. Friend of the show, Big Vito. Yeah. Who... It will, for those of you who watch him as he debuts, you're watching the shows along with us, and you haven't seen any of this period of WCW before, it may genuinely alarm you how over Vito gets within about six months. It's amazing. Yes. (laughs) Like, he really, you know, like, of the guys that debut in the last year and a half, you have to give Vito a huge amount of credit for, like, he took what was a very two-dimensional gimmick. And he got over like fucking Rover in this oh, company. What if we had the Sopranos wrestle? That That's the gimmick. Yeah, essentially. And definitely like not fucking written by anybody who is good at TV writing either. <laughs> anyway, we have that to look forward I mean, to now over the next month. Yeah. Uh, Jeff Jarrett is wandering around with a 2 by 4 and creative control looking for people to beat up. Uh, we have our six-person tag team elimination match. The Filthy Animals of Eddie Guerrero, Kidman and Tori. Versus the revolution of Asia, Dean Malenko, and Perry Saturn with Shane Douglas. Is it just me, or did this match start like they were already short on time? Yes, they ran through this match very, very quickly. I I did laugh. They did a bit where Tori, they teased Tori was going to do a suicide dive. That was funny. 
Uh, it reminded me of that famous time, and every time that this spot comes up, I bring it up, that our friend Johnny, <laughs> we, were at an, we were at an OTT show, <laughs> and Shah Samuels, who at the time was carrying a bit of timber, you might say, yes. uh, teased doing a suicide dive. And everybody from our section of chairs ran away, except Johnny, who stood up completely still, head on with Shah Samuels, and didn't move. And then very loudly said, as if Shah Samuels got to do a fucking dive, or as if Shah Samuels yeah. got to do a fucking toe pay, lads. <laughs> Calm down. I think it was as, you know, the, the trainees were trying to clear us away. Yeah. And Johnny was just like, I am not fucking moving. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, not a chance. <laughs> Steadfast. And you know what? He was right. He was right. Yeah. Um, Eddie is hugely over in this crowd, which, again, is very disappointing that this is a guy that, even in spite of the way the company treats him, is somebody they really could have elevated and done a lot with, and they let him go in mm-hmm. a couple of months. Um. So they this match kind of ambles on. They do a bit where Tori is working like she has a broken ankle. Uh, the guys come to check uh, in on her. They all get uh, jumped. We have... This is where Eddie Eddie is checking on Tori and he pushes away yeah. Kidman and Kidman gets rolled up. Yeah, Kidman gets rolled up and then there's a bit of a, a palaver between the two of them. Uh, we get Eddie versus Asia. Eddie frog splashes Asia and pins her. Um... I thought this was really funny that um, the producer at this point uh, backstage completely fucks it and starts playing the Filthy Animals music because mm-hmm. they think it's one fall to a finish. No, that was when Kidman got rolled up. They played the Revolution music. Oh, they played the Revolution. Yeah, that was yeah, it. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. They played the Revolution. Yeah, but it's the same principle. It's like yes. they fucking... They we're, in, we're in paying attention. Thought, yeah. Yes. And no one handed them the format sheet. Um... So Saturn starts to get a hold of things, hits a DVD, kick out. Uh, Shane calls a slow count as Saturn goes up top. He misses his elbow. Uh, Eddie instinctively goes to try and make the hot tag, remembers it's Tory, goes back to try and valiantly fight on by himself, eats a, uh, does a Hurricane Rana, goes for a crossbody, gets reversed into the rings, and Eddie taps. Uh, biggest pop of the night so far for the prospect of man and woman violence between Saturn and Tory. That, uh, that, Tori, that that's a running theme throughout this show is the threat of yes. man on woman violence yes uh tory mule kicks saturn for a near fall shane then distracts the ref uh saturn returns the favor with the kick down low and wins uh, we then go to the back um I, as creative control i love that in all of that you skipped over dean malenko getting eliminated this was so fucking nothing. <laughs> hey, so, the, this match was so fucking nothing. Dean man. Malenko has a big part to play in this show. How dare you? This guy, dismiss. You want to talk about another? Yeah, you want to talk about another fucking like what was Dave smoking this night? Two and a half stars. Not even close. Not even. This was dreadful. No, this it was really so was dreadful. like for a match that was built around Eddie. Pretty much, it was a bad match, and it wasn't Eddie's fault. A match that has four. Excellent wrestlers in us. And like you could argue, yeah, you could argue <laughs> that you could argue that Kidman is like not on the level of the other three. But yeah, you could you could say that like you got three excellent wrestlers, one very good wrestler, Tory, who's incredibly not over a wrestler, yeah, incredibly over, yes. Um, and, and Asia, who always gets pops when she does the power like, moves power against, spots the yeah. against the men, yeah. There was a and match you could have made where, where this was, like, impressive and got pops and instead they just rushed through it all. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. For sure. Um, yeah, backstage, Creative Control and Jeff beat down Buff Bagwell. This leads us into the loser must retire match. Um, Buff Bagwell versus Kurt Hennig. Uh, it really, the Hennig storyline looks even more like bullshit when you put it in a video package about how he can't lose or let, or he'll retire and then it's a super cut of him losing but not the right way since he can't lose i think he has lost four times on tv yeah 
He lost He lost at least one by submission. He's yes. lost by DQ, and I think he's lost by count out as well. Yes, he has. But because he hasn't been oh, pinned, boy. which is not what yeah. they stipulated. They just said he can't lose. Nope. Yeah. Um, they they started after me the second time he lost, saying, "Oh, it can only be pinfall." Um. So the uh, Buffs music plays twice. By the way, uh, the Mayhem video wall at the top of the ramp has a giant Electronic Arts logo on it. it we should have mentioned. Yes. Um. So Buffs music plays twice, but the instead of Buff. It's Jeff and it's creative control. They rush the ring and beat the shit out of Kurt. For some reason, the bell rings in the middle of this to start the match, even though Buff is not there. Oh, did I miss the bell ringing? Yes, they, 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 the fucking bell ringer was fucking on one tonight. Um, Buff then comes running out with the 2 by 4 uh, and the heels bail. Hennig then jumps Buff. They do a walk and brawl on the outside. Hennig is distracted by shouting at a Canadian fan, who we will see again later. And Buff elbows him off the apron into the fence for the heat. Hennig, this is now, right? We've talked about how Hennig is washed. And we've talked about how since Buff came back from the neck he, the mm-hmm. neck injury, he's fucking washed physically. This is one of the most interminably long headlock spots I have ever seen on a wrestling pay-per-view. And I have seen most of the career of one Randall Keith Orton. <laughs> <laughs> this is this man if Randy Orton was watching this pay-per-view he he went oh he was turgid at the thought of this fucking this headlock he went from six to midnight watching this he was fucking <laughs> feeling it <laughs> he went from Sean Walton to midnight he, he was hearing those he was hearing those voices in his pants let me tell you when he was watching this headlock spot <laughs> oh god uh, there was yeah. plenty of snake I, sperm on his entrance ramp that night I can officially say your description of this headlock was much more engaging than the actual headlock itself and also didn't take half as fucking long unfortunately yes yes the headlock now, just never ended I will say either side of the headlock Hedig hits a couple of gruesome chops to the chest like deafening chops which made me think like a match where he just stiffs Buff Bagwell around with chops would be way better than a headlock match (laughs) anyway uh, scoop slam on an elbow drop for two Hennig largely on top in this match this is I I think my main bugbear with agenting in WCW now is the WCW match is one guy, and it doesn't necessarily have to be the face or the heel. One guy, t- one guy takes ninety percent of the match, mm-hmm. and then the other guy hits one move, then is finish, then it's over. That is basically it's the formula that is every Lash Larue match we're watching the yep. last three months. It's not just him though, and this is what happens here, where Hennig is just beating this man pillar to post for most of this match. Um chokes him for so long in a headlock it would have killed like a small village's worth of people that's how much air was cut off <laughs> um, and then they get up Buff does a boot in the corner blockbuster and just wins yep and now Kurt Hennig must retire maybe he gets a standing ovation and they talk about the great career of Kurt Hennig Lee how long has Kurt Hennig retired for? I, w- I will give you t- uh, two questions, right? Don't Google it. How long has Kurt Hennig retired for? And if you agree that he's not retired, who is his first match back from retirement then? Who would make the most sense? He's definitely not retired. Okay. And his first match back... Well, how long? Oh, how long? Uh... eight days okay um, his first match back will be against Brad Armstrong okay I can confirm that his retirement does indeed last for eight days yep 
He's not back on the Nitro, but he's back on the following Nitro. Mm -hmm. Uh, but unfortunately, you didn't actually think low enough on the, the totem pole for who he wrestles. Ooh. In a two-minute match on Nitro next week, he wrestles Midnight. Ah. I think he loses as well. So there you are. Cool. That's uh, the end of the career of Kurt Heading. It must be a different guy in a week. Is this like when the Kurt Ultimate Heading. Warrior died and came back as a different Ultimate Warrior? Yes, this must be it. Um, Tanae is backstage with Steve Stinger. Uh, he said he shouldn't have to fight to regain what he never really lost, but he's almost there anyway. It's still showtime. Uh, we then move to the other semi-final, which is Sting versus Bret Hart. Tony says it is showtime, but now it's go time. Um, I have to say, what is this Bret music, by the way? Oh, it's cut off, isn't it? Because this is our first pay-per-view cycle now with the original soundtrack we have no more dubs thank god mm -hmm. in the versions we're watching this music is bad yeah they're, like, like the generic wwe network one is better there's no um there's no way for this music to get a pop like there's no it just starts off as a rumble and like then goes into this really bad fucking butt rock yeah and so much butt rock. There's no connection to make you think that this is Bret Hart, other than Bret Hart walks out eventually. Yeah. Um, did you enjoy the pink and white? He's wearing the pink and white instead of the dominant pink and black colors in this match. But he has, he has he the pink and white on his tights. Yeah. yeah. There's black in it, but it's the 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 tights are uh, pink and white. Oh, with only huh. little bits of black. Yeah. I didn't recall. I thought you had the the yeah, black yeah. the black tights with the pink singlet. Um, I've, it didn't make a mark on me, so obviously I didn't fucking notice that much. The the upside of having this version of the recording as well is we got to hear Seek and Destroy. We did. Now, here's the thing. They are now pushing Sting as a face again. Yes. This what? is the full final, like, he's just a face now. Why did they have Brett come out in his Wayne Gretzky Canada jersey first? Yeah. Obviously, or if... Why, did, why could you not have just had him wrestle subtle heel and then do the full turn after? Like, he's, he's a baby face now. But just have Sting... You know, just wait. Just have Sting come out first and he'll get a pop. Yeah. You don't have to have fucking Canadian hero Bret Hart come out first. Is uh, Sting the most spoiled for choice in the history of WCW when it comes to theme songs? Ooh, that's a good question. Because he, like, he, the Crow theme is one of the most iconic original songs they ever came up with. And he dumps that for fucking Seek and Destroy. <laughs> well, he, he dumped, technically he dumped it for the Wolfpack team. That's true. Which also is an all-timer mm -hmm. for that company. Yeah. Um, it's a pretty good run. Uh, Man Called Sting, great song. Yes. Um, he does this and he does that. Yes. But yeah, no, Sting Sting's definitely one with a great uh, disc discography. Yeah. Um, can't say that word. But this match, what did you think of this match? Um, I was quite enjoying it until shenanigans took over. And then like that kind of... I don't think it was as good as... Benoit Jarrett earlier in the night. Yeah, it felt... Do you know what? Like, so a weird quirk of this is that, do you know that the two semifinals were to the second exactly the same length of time? Really? Yeah, according to hey. the, the Pro Fight DB here, they were both nine minutes and 27 seconds. And my main point about this match was the nine minutes and 27 seconds earlier felt really spaced out very well. And it mm -hmm. felt like they got the exact match they wanted to have in where it felt like in this with the shenanigans and everything, they were trying to cram in 18 minutes worth of stuff. Yeah. I into think it. I know there was shenanigans in the first one, but it felt like that all came like right at the end and it just finished. Um, I think these guys were going out to have a sting by heart match and it was cut short by shenanigans, as you say. Whereas the other lad... And it just felt like the, the also particular shenanigans made no sense to me, as we'll talk about in a second. Whereas the other guys knew what they were going to have at the end of the match, so they just yeah. fucking ripped it up for eight minutes. Um, yeah. But 
all that said, I don't necessarily think this was a bad match. I just don't think it was as good of a match as these two could have had if they kind of got two stars. If if they had have said, look, we have eight minutes, let's cut out a little bit of this kind of slow grappling. And if they just kind of let loose for, like I say, five minutes. Yeah. I think it would have been a far superior Um, match. I'm starting to think like in the totality of the night in hindsight, that was the goal of the night from Russo, because obviously Russo can't write this in a way that's compelling, but was his idea at the core of it to keep teasing that Brett was going to be screwed only for him to repeatedly overcome the possibility that he would be. He doesn't want to do it the wrong way. He wants to do it the right way. Because at this point, like he doesn't get screwed, but the finish doesn't go the way he wants because Package and Liz come out. Package batters Sting in the leg with a bat. Brett attacks Package, puts him in a sharpshooter. Mickey J calls the bell, but he DQs Sting. Yes. Even though Sting didn't, like, especially in front of Mickey J, didn't do anything. And then Brett says, no, 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 we're going to restart the match. So is the idea that they're going to keep teasing, burning the Canadian crowd with a fuck finish of some sort, but Brett is going to make sure they get a happy ending? I mean, maybe. Uh, like, they're not, they're definitely, whatever they're trying, they're not executing it well. I think we can agree on that. I, I, I'm just trying to figure out what it is the idea in their head is. I think Russo, um, it, it's complicated because Russo obviously has these these feelings about how Owen was treated post Montreal. And he obviously, like a lot of the 97 stuff, Russo would have been involved with, with Brett and stuff. Yeah. And and holy shit, like they really do push a lot on what Brett's been through this year yeah, on commentary. Oh, they do, yeah. Um, and like Owen Hart is one of the main characters on this show. <laughs> And I get that Russo obviously wanted to do right by Brett. And that's where this whole idea with the tournament and giving Brett his crowning moment that he hadn't gotten in the two years he's been in this fucking company. Yeah. And again, look, we'll be the first ones to knock Russo. But we've said in the first, you know, pay-per-view cycle of his run, he identified that Sid versus Goldberg and Bret Hart should be a main eventer. Dear the things he's done right. Um, like I, I, I did think a lot, and we'll we'll talk about it later. But like, if if some of the stuff that happened on this show happened two years ago, would it have helped? Not necessarily turn things around, but stall the decline a bit. I mean, probably. Yeah. But we'll we'll talk about that a bit more in detail. Um. Uh, later. But yeah. I, um, I I don't necessarily think they were giving off that kind of Brett is going to be screwed vibe. I think it was more to just build up Brett as this valiant baby face that's come, overcome the leg injury. He's overcome the outsiders fucking with his shit. He's now overcome the referees kind of screwing over his opponents, I suppose. Yeah. Like, it's odd. It's like, like I said, with a lot of the tournament, none of it really makes sense. But like Brett gets his two kind of clean wins here. And that's that's what it was all about, yeah. really. So Sting gets DQ'd, but Brett says restart the match. Mickey J agrees. Uh, Russian leg sweep for two. Uh, Brain was really on Brett, saying it was a huge mis- mistake to restart the match. And stupid, he could have just taken his breather, taken his win, and gone on to the final later. But Tony puts him over huge as being like the you know he wants to do it the right way. Uh, Brett hammers so the Scorpion Deathlock. Uh, gets applied. Brett hammers Sting's bad leg from the bat shot, reverses it into the sharpshooter, and Sting taps. Um, I don't necessarily... I go two ways on whether... like I didn't feel too wild about the fact that they played into the attack that had been done on Sting to give Brett the win, but also I could see Brett going, by doing this, I'm protecting my hold as a finish people can't get out of. Mm-hmm. As like, I need to figure out a way to get out of the death lock without making the, 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 the sharpshooter look weak. Um, so I guess that it was probably the, the only way he could conceive of doing that. Also, they were playing off the... Again, I'm assuming this was Brett doing most of the, the thinking here. They were playing off when Luger attacked Brett last yes. month. Mm-hmm. and hit him in the ankle with the bat. And, yeah. and was that Nitro? 
Yes, and that played into their pay per view match last month. Yeah. Um, and then obviously Luger coming in here with the bat, and then he, he, he you know, swerve bro, turns on Sting. Um, I think they do over it a little bit by calling this the greatest win of Sting's life and career. Or not, sorry, Our, Brett's life and career. Yeah, just a tad. And then the full verification of the Sting babyface turn happens as Sting calls him back into the ring. They do a stare down and then do the cool guy handshake. Mm-hmm. Uh, then we have Benoit backstage looking forward to the challenge of later tonight, uh, acknowledging the fact that the two of them are friends, but they won't leave anything... Uh, back in their match uh now i fucking lost it at this next bit i knew you would i need people to understand that this segment takes place no later than two minutes after maybe three after lex luger had been put in a sharpshooter well no lex brett brett takes the baseball bat off lex and does like the most gentle, you know, like body check. Yeah. To like Lex's upper chest, not even near yeah. his throat with the bat. Yeah. And then there's a sharpshooter. Yes. Right. So in spite of the fact that, yes, he was hit in the chest and then a submission hold that focuses on the legs and lower back was applied. We cut to Lex in a neck brace. Lex somehow wants us to believe that in that three minutes, he had time to gather himself up from the ring run backstage get a full check out from a doctor and be put in a neck brace Uh, I think he was claiming misaligned vertebrae in his spine yes Um, and he says he feels he can't compete tonight bizarrely he doesn't mention the fact that he still he hasn't been written off he he still has to compete Um, like he's not saying he's not cleared because obviously like this is bullshit And he said, I feel so bad for the fans. I am going to write a personal check to each and every fan that feels disappointed tonight. And then he pauses, looks over at Elizabeth and says, ain't that great of me, Liz? (laughs) And she's like, yeah, it's really great, Lex. (laughs) (laughs) Again, we've been saying it for weeks now. This total package character has been an absolute fucking highlight. Oh, it's so fucking funny. It's so fucking funny. I really love it. And I love Tony uh, Shivani's. Like, where did he get a surgical collar from in that time? Yeah. He's yeah, like, like they're, they're not just lying around. You don't just get them. <laughs> yeah, not not even for one second are the commentary buying this, which is great. Um, I'll tell you what isn't great. A chain match. Vampiro and Berlin. And this is funny because this goes down... We had a conversation about this on the Go Home Show. Is this a chain match or is it a dog collar match? And it turns out the answer to that is yes. Well, it's also neither. because it's being co- it's being a c- called a chain match, but it's clearly a dog collar in the ring, and then immediately it becomes more of a chain match because one person just simply goes, "Well, what if I didn't get in the dog collar?" <laughs> and the match just happens. Also, one person in the match is very rarely in the match. Yes, this fucking blue. This, I fucking hated this. Oh, it was god-awful. Um, not least because Oklahoma and Doc came out with their bar- bar- barbecue sauce. And again, I don't know what Dave Meltzer was smoking because if Oklahoma was anything like this on that debut segment... Vampiro! Um, Vampiro! Vampiro! This, <laughs> this was so irritating so bad apart from the moment where he described the look of these two wrestlers as outrageous vaudeville which okay no funny he, ha- he had one other good line okay Oklahoma. Uh, had, i don't think i have it written down oklahoma had one good line is it when he completely fabricates a college football career oh, no, that, that, for sorry he had to to then the, the college football career of the wall yes where he says something about the University of Germany at Frankfurt. Yes. And about him, I think, winning the Bratwurst Bowl or something yes, like that. Yes, the Bratwurst Bowl. Yeah, that was one. Um, no, he also compares Berlin to a young Danny Hodge. The- <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah, I'll give it okay, And Tony Schiavone comes in with, didn't Danny Hodge have, like, the, like the strongest grip imaginable? And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah. Berlin, Berlin reminds me a lot of him. Like, 
Kitten. Mm. That's like, okay, that's a good JR. So, yeah, so as we discussed, Berlin just went, no, I'm not wearing the dog collar. Mm-hmm. And instead, he hits the ref in the head with the chain and then just starts whomping on Vamp. And yes, most of this match is the wall wrestling Vampiro and Berlin wrestling Jerry only. And it's awful. Yes. And for some You're trying to remember if I have the valet no, the, the, the valets the right way around. No, you're correct. It's just the fact that yes. I, I'm trying to remember at what point do we see Jerry only is then taped to the ringside barrier. Uh there's also the bit where uh in a match he's not even in, the wall voluntarily puts on the dog collar. Isn't that right at the end? And then and, and uh, it's about halfway through. Yeah. And also starts going for pins and the ref is counting the pins. Yes. They, uh, man. And then so ultimately Alex mad. Berlin decides to pull the wall off of these pins that he wants no part of. Yeah. Yeah. He wants no part of this match but he doesn't want the wall to make pin covers in a match he's not in. Like I don't want the wall to make pin covers in a match he's not in either but I think in a different way from what Berlin is alleging here. So... In classic Russo fashion, no two people can stay friends for more than two months. Yeah. And Berlin and the Wall are now true, I think. The Wall the wall got an official name a week ago, and they've already split up. Oh, I will say, Connor watched this. Or sorry, they, they aren't actually yet, but they're, they're teasing the split up. Connor watched this part of the show with me. Um, yes. And he was like, is his name Berlin? I was like, yeah. And it's his name, The Wall. I was like, yeah. He's like, oh, The Berlin Wall. Oh, yeah, that's good. Yeah. Yep. That, an 11-year-old just went, ah. Yeah, and you know what? Me in 1999, the same reaction where it's like, oh, yeah, I see what they've done there. Um. So Vamp eventually gets a chain-assisted camel clutch in and Berlin just passes out. But then, obviously, because this is Vince Russo, the result isn't as important it, it, as the angle. You have to refer to him by his real name now of Vampiro. Vampiro. Yeah. Uh, oh, the wall stormed off, by the way, yes, after that little tiff. Did. Yeah. Um, so Berlin passes out. This allows Doc to come in and suplex Vamp, Oklahoma Stampede on Jerry, Dr. Bomb on Vamp, flips him the bird, as if you didn't think... Like, do you remember I was saying this was a stone cold segment when he came out and way waste everybody? Mm-hmm. If you thought there was a moment of subtlety where maybe they're not doing stone cold, he was wearing a leather waistcoat. He was. He came out after a match and stomped people to bits. He did. He then jawed in their faces when they were dead, flipped them the bird, and called for a beer. Yeah. Fucking awful. Fuck this show. Fuck this match. Fuck Vince Russo. <laughs> I was uh, this is like I was about to text you and go, can we just skip a week? Like, can we just not do I don't know if I have it in me to because I was watching this in the middle of the night and I got so fucking mad about it. Because I don't know if you noticed, know Dave, but Dr. Death is in fact the real Steve Williams. Yes, yes. Get it? Uh, this is your second minus one star match of the night. And I feel that might be generous. That, that's incredibly generous for this match. That yeah. wasn't a match. The other, mi- the other minus one was harsh. This was generous. Yes. And then we head into our third minus one star Dave rated match of the night, which I think might also have been harsh. But first, we have two backstage segments because, of course, we do. Uh, Tanae explains because Rick Steiner was murdered dead the TV title this explains our confusion on the last show by the way the TV title was vacated and Scott Hall was just like I'll have that well no I think the way they explain it is Rick Steiner was supposed to face Scott Hall in a title versus title match for reasons yeah and instead Sid Power One went through the stage because Sid is the hero that we all needed and Scott Hall won because reasons Anyway, he says, if anyone wants a shot, they can come right here. And he crotch chops. No, no, uh, no, no. Which I thought, Again, you're, you're missing the bits. You, I mean, the bit is... You come, well, there's, you a, there's right an overarching here. point I want to make, so I'm rushing through it, but go on. Yeah, the, the whole Scott Hall bit is you can come right here and somebody says, where? And 
then he does crotch chop because you know they weren't allowed crotch chop yeah now the thing I want to point out is <laughs> when Scott Hall does the I'm a wrestler with backstage power and I don't give a fuck bits he looks extremely cool mm-hmm and when the young bucks do it, they look like fucking dorks. Yes. There's lessons to be learned here. <laughs> um, be friends and with Kevin And this is Ash. far less... There's far less thinking... This is the other thing that's so fucking embarrassing about the young bucks version of things is there is clearly far less thought being put into what Scott is doing here than the young bucks who are obsessively thinking about everything they do to be really cutesy and referential and stuff. Mm-hmm. And they will never have one-tenth of the aura this man had. Also, do you know what Scott Hall never did? What? Dress up as other people. This is very true. This is very true. Kevin Ash did. Kevin uh, Ash dressed up as the Grand Wizard. Uh, and Aaron Anderson and... And Oz. Uh, yeah, and Oz. <laughs> so much cosplay. <laughs> uh, but even he was incredibly cool. Now, look, he pulled uh, off the Grand anyway. Wizard. Yes. Um, Kimberly arrives backstage two full hours into a pay-per-view <laughs> and like 15 minutes before her match. Incredible. Um, Next up, a match that I think, okay, right. In terms of wrestling, yeah, maybe minus one star. In terms of entertainment, very harsh from Dave. This is Total Package versus Meng. I had a hoot because we'll talk about it in a second, but Lex's master plan is revealed in this. Yes. Now, I really, there's a thing, if I had booked this, that I think would have put this over the top in terms of comedy, and I'm very sad they didn't do it. Go for it. They should have had him do the full stripper pants thing. In the neck brace? Was just, like, in the neck brace. Okay. Like, they they should have done it where he's just, like, tiny jocks, huge neck brace. (laughs) And, like, he's clearly oiled himself up, even though he's saying he's not able to compete. (laughs) Um, it's a shame he doesn't have the bow flex yet that he could be doing the bow flex bit but also be like ah with the neck see this is how you get a neck brace gimmick over not this fucking Roddy Strong shit yeah that we had or you do year. it like or the one with uh, Buff and Steiner where Buff comes out in like a full body cast <laughs> that time with Dr. Cecil Swartz those are the two ways to no do that it. was Scott that was in the full body cast that's what I mean yeah, yeah. but it was with Buff oh, yeah, and Dr. Yeah, Cecil, yeah. Cecil Swartz yeah um um yeah. But I thought this match was tremendously funny um, because, one, you have the hubris of Lex Luger because the idea is that he thinks he's smarter than everybody, but he's dumb as fuck, mm-hmm. right? And the idea that he thinks that if he comes out in the neck brace, he'll garner sympathy from Meng, who obviously just immediately fucking batters him, is really funny. And then Tony, about a minute in, just goes, wait, hold on. He's wearing a neck brace and Meng's finish is the tongue and deck rape. He's not going to be able to do it. <laughs> and then Meng tries to do the and tongue like, and deck See? See? And his, his hand essentially repels off him like bullets, bullets off Superman. <laughs> and yeah, Tony's like, see? He can't do it. He, he actually says it's a tactical neck brace. Yeah. So in 1999, we had the tactical neck brace. Yeah. Before Christian's tactical turtleneck. Oh my god. And then like Meng gets annoyed when he realizes what's going on. It just like takes Lex down and starts stomping him in the head. And Lex is just like, help, <laughs> help. <laughs> <laughs> then uh, Lex gets up, clears him out with a clothesline, but then Meng just Mengs up, stops selling, batters him again. Uh then Liz is trying to for ages yeah. work with like a pepper spray gimmick, like badly sells the two lads short on this because it takes about thirty seconds and the two of them look like idiots. Accidentally sprays Lex in the face, which I think would have been really funny if it had been timed right, that like everything this guy tries just blows up and he's like the wily e. coyote of wrestling. Mm-hmm. Where just every elaborate plan, like if he's just, he needs to come to every arena with like a giant wooden box Bo- that has Acme written on it. Bo- box o gimmicks. Yeah, yeah, like, we need to have uh, a show where, like, somebody is running away from Lex and just paints a really convincing-looking tunnel on the wall. <laughs> Lex runs into it. Uh. Um, But, yeah, so then he, Meng pulls off the neck brace, gets the death grip, and immediately wins. 
I thought it was bizarre, but I was laughing most of the way through it. So, Listen, like, for, in terms of entertainment value, I can't fault them. Pack, package is a highlight of the show now. For sure. Um, so, Gene is with Brett. He says, your dream of being WCW champion is close, but you're wrestling a friend in Canada. He says, friendship is put aside tonight. And then Lex wanders by asking for or shouting for where Liz is after going to because she booked it after the finish. Uh, I'm just going to read this next sentence sans context. I tweeted it out earlier today. Um, I think it explains itself, really. Um, Gormless idiot David Flair silently wanks off a crowbar backstage. A crowbar. That's all I'll say. A crowbar. Yeah, Devin Storm nowhere to be seen. Um, They're really trying to do a David Flair is like Norman Bates thing. And it's so not working. Like, they're trying to do the thing that, like, he's, like, a serial killer. Um, and it's just so not... Like, it is, it, it's the least intimidating person on this roster, including the Nitro Girls. Yeah, that's harsh. Nope. It's 100% not. I would fancy myself in a fight with David Flair, and I think at least half of the Nitro Girls would take me in a fight. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's probably all of them are undeniably more athletic than him. Well, that's probably because Larry Zabisco will have personally and, trained all the Nitro girls, and at least half the Nitro girls are taller than him. Mm. I'm just saying, mate. That you know the numbers don't lie. They spell disaster for you at sacrifice. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> um, yeah, I was, I was but yeah, it's like this over the shoulder shot. Like you see him hunched over like some gearboxes, and the hand is going, and it pans around and. Like, yeah, he's wanking off this crowbar with a towel. Uh, and then also now he's got <laughs> creepy eye makeup to make him look like he hasn't slept. But it just makes him look like he's going through like a, a goth, goth phase. phase. Yeah. He's he's very he's very Kevin and Perry coded. Like that he's about to be like, oh, dad. <laughs> like anytime anyone says anything to him. Uh, like he, he looks like he's been t- hanging around Central Bank for the last four hours. Like, mm. Mm. Yeah. A very niche Irish reference yes. there for people. Um, it's where all the scene kids used to hang out in Dublin, folks. Um, right, WCW United States Heavyweight Title and World Television Title Match. Uh, Scott Hall versus Booker T. Booker T answers the challenge. Scott over as fuck in Canada. Mm-hmm. Like, to the point where Booker T gets a good reaction, but it, it does comparatively seem like no one gives a fuck about Booker compared to Scott. Also, Scott Hall coming out to the Wolfpack team is not something we see too often. Yes. Incredibly cool. No, not anymore, for sure. Also, I think it's really interesting because I can't say I liked this match, but it was fascinating because it was two men wrestling entirely different matches at the same time. Yeah. Uh, th- this match ultimately left me disappointed. Yeah. Um... But it's also two of my faves, so I was incredibly into the match itself. Yeah. I um I I saw it as Scott doing all smoke and mirrors and his trademark moves. Yes. And then anytime Booker got a minute, he wants to go sixty mile an hour, all athletic, mm-hmm. all action. And it just didn't gel. It just didn't gel. No. Um one, one of the- It's also a bit stiff. There's a bit where Scott hits a clothesline to send Booker over the yes. top, and he fucking batters him with this clothesline. Now, to be fair, Booker gets him back because Booker hits a side kick to his forehead. Yes, he does. Um, Jeff Jarrett comes out again yep. with creative the control. The SSR all over the show. Yes. <laughs> we They go for Booker. We're asked to remember the suspension of Stevie, which I did not. Why was Stevie um, suspended? Did you remember? I don't, uh, this must have been a Nitro thing. That they just thought, you know, let's not explain it on Thunder. Because it definitely didn't happen on Thunder. No. Um, Jeff distracts Booker. Hits the uh, uh, Scott hits the outsider edge and wins. Uh, the trio then put the boots to Booker. Uh, then we get lights out. And sadly it was not Sabu. Uh, a bell chimes and it's midnight. And she clears house with Booker. Now, I don't get me wrong, Lee. It was a clue. It was a cool clearing house spot, but I did for a brief moment in time imagine the tag team of Booker T and Sabu running roughshod over the WCW roster, and it would tickled me. Well, I mean, considering the last time the lights went out, you heard Seek and Destroy, so you had to have your hopes up. 
It's true. Holy shit. Like, we haven't actually talked that much about that. <laughs> if you want to get our full breakdown, by the way, of the Wembley show, go to the Voices of Wrestling YouTube channel for our post-post show from our hotel room. But, yeah, two successive years, the two of us have, like, jumped up and down and embraced at the sound of Seek and Destroy. What a time to be alive. Um, Lex still backstage looking for Liz. Um, then Tony sets up the Flair Kimberly match, uh, and he. What's brilliant is this, Tony is trying to big it up as an important, uh, heated match. And if you just look to his right, Bobby Heenan is sitting there just shaking his fucking head, <laughs> like he doesn't want. He doesn't want any part of this company, but he doesn't want any part of this in particular. Yeah, man on woman violence, um, folks. It's uh, gonna be a yeah. regular occurrence, unfortunately. Now again. A, no- a nice thing about having this version of the recording is we get to hear the fake Nirvana song yes. a couple of times in this show. A- um, and again, I will come back to my son was watching this segment of the, of the show with me, and he went, mm-hmm. "Oh my god, that's just a smell like it smells like Teen Spirit." <laughs> I was like, yeah. "Yes, it is, son. Yes, it is." Um, th- this is basically a non-match, so I'm not going to do many spots because there aren't any can't, really. Can't. But I do want to talk about how Kimberly Page legitimately in better shape than almost half the roster yes that is true <laughs> but can can I say do you like, I'll ask you this question do you think Vince Russo personally selected Kimberly's attire in the hope that something would fall out of place if I had to put my house in it I would say yes because I don't think, like, when she came out dressed like that, I was like, okay, total angle. She's not going to be physically involved here. She was far too physically involved wearing those clothes because... There were certainly some spots that I feel like Vince Russo definitely suggested, including the bit where she's on her knees begging her, begging him not to hit her in the head with a crowbar, Mm -hmm. which is getting all kinds of horrible reactions from the crowd. And she strongly insinuates that she's going to she perform oral sex on yes. him yeah. if he relents uh, to the point where she starts undoing his trousers. But then she takes the cup, beans him in the head, kicks him in the balls because she'd done a kick earlier and he no sold it, revealing the fact he was wearing protection. Um, now, I will say all of this that I've just described, with the exception of the looming threat of man or woman violence, none of this is getting a reaction. No. Until it, you get a kind of light laughter when she stuffs the cup in his mouth. Um, Now, she also, you want to talk about sh- uh, like stiff shots in this show? Uh, the roundhouse she hits him with in the head. That was full shoe on temple contact and I laughed. <laughs> what? I love that you laugh at David Flair getting hurt. Like, why? What, what, do. What's he ever done to you? Because I've, I've now had to be subjected to him for like a year's worth of TV. I feel like I've earned this. <laughs> um, Now, maybe my biggest pop on the show. He grabs the crowbar again and fucking Canyon comes back. Thank fuck. Champagne Chris Canyon. Champagne Chris Canyon. Just even, like, again, I know because it's WCW, it's not like this guy's going to be world champion. I know this. But just knowing that there's one more good wrestler on the roster, which reduces the possibility of seeing all bad matches slightly, um, that that cheers me up. He takes out Flair. Page comes out just as Flair hits Canyon in the balls with a crowbar, hits the cutter, uh, goes back to batter him with the crossbar, and Arn Anderson stops it. Oh, fuck this bit as well. So this is a complete non-finish, by the way. Oh, yeah. Well, it was a non-starter. Um, yeah. Um, Aaron, stops the, 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 Aaron stops the violence. Then Flair batters Aaron in the lower back with the crowbar. And then they proceed to, again, on the night where one of the main characters, without being there, that you were talking about is Bret Hart. Or, sorry, his own heart. You do a stretcher job on Arn where you try to sell it like he's paralyzed in the ring and you're doing the Owen voice as you're trying to sell this. And this goes on for an uncomfortably long period of time. This got way more time than anything else on the show. And like focusing in on Arn being glassy-eyed and not responsive 
Tony making a point to go, he hasn't moved his legs once. Um, I did find it funny that this crowd did not buy this angle for one second. Nope. Uh, they should have booted out of the fucking building, to be honest. But at one point, they put the neck brace on Aaron, and I'm pretty sure they start chanting, take it off. I think they were... Now, this unfortunately could have been yeah. at Kimberly. No, I think they were chanting to a woman in the crowd because a lot of them were looking behind ah. the announcers. Great. Okay, so they were too busy being sexist to be offended. Yes. Which is... Basically. Imagine that. 1999, folks. Because I don't know if it's... I, I didn't make a note of it, but over the course of like the last three or four matches, the crowd are incredibly distracted. Yeah. Yeah, they they really start losing their steam. Now, this next match gets them back, mm. but um, yeah, uh, we get a. I don't want to talk about that anymore. It was fucking horrible, distasteful ending to that segment. Uh, that was a, a terrible match. This, by the way, I believe is the match that. So yeah, the Scott Hall match got three quarters of one star. Okay. Um, and this non-match with Flair and Kimberly rightfully got minus two stars. Yeah, can't complain. Uh, next up, we have a great video package for Sid and Goldberg. Then we get a Sid promo. He says he finds it very funny that today he could ever think he would say I quit. He will break every bone in Goldberg's body. He will tear every muscle, pull every fiber of skin until Goldberg admits that he is the master. And then we get Goldberg versus Sid Vicious. Now, the only two things I'm going to say about this match and then I'm handing it over to you because this is, this is Sid Corner for you. The crowd was back immediately for this. This was fucking hot yeah. as balls, this match. Yeah. This was over like fuck. Big time entrances. Uh, the other thing I was going to say was this was a perfect start in as much as you didn't want the bell to ring and them to lock up. So this was as soon as Goldberg's boots touched the apron, Sid attacked. Yeah. It, it, and it was on I believe in your capable hands now it was on Roy from the moment the Goldberg got to the ring um, yeah I mean look if you've seen one Sid Goldberg match you've, you've seen it and that's not a bad thing these two just fucking like walloped each other for I don't know how long the match went um, uh, I'll get a feeling it had to be less than 10 minutes it was 5 minutes 30 yeah, like it was just intent like you want to talk about intense wrestlers these two epitomize what being an intense wrestler is and i just think sometimes you get magic when you make uh people opponents and that's what sid and goldberg were i think they were just magic across from each other the matches didn't have to be like you said you didn't want to see these guys lock up and have a technical wrestling match you wanted these guys to just go in there and beat the absolute fuck out of each other. Especially coming off the match um, last month at Halloween Havoc where it was just a fucking bloodbath. Yeah. The idea of this being an I quit match. Um, I actually forgot what the finish was here so I was intrigued to see how they got out of it because I knew there was no way either guy was going to say I quit. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, like this this match is just fucking five minutes of big fucking shots. Um I loved Sid using the choke slam and just fucking asking the ref, like just saying to the ref, ask him. Like like the choke slam was gonna be enough to make somebody say I quit. Also these choke slams, like hard as fucking nails mm-hmm. like it felt like for a moment that this ring was one of those old wwf concrete rings it fucking the way some inch, like, yeah, yeah yeah um the finish i think the finish protected sid so much yeah and if the idea is that sid is going to be one of your guys and i mean look we, we talked about it ever since sid has came came in at the end of the summer he has been one of the guys in this company. It it felt like for the first month, they kind of went, let's bring him in as a heater. Yes. And then, like, the man just got over as fuck. And they were just like, let's just fucking keep going with this. It's like, we, we said at the time, like, you want to talk about somebody that they focus Thunder around. Like, Sid's mm-hmm. been the main focus on Thunder for pretty much the whole second half of the year. Yeah. And... 
I don't know if the idea was that they were protecting Sid or if they were more trying to set up Goldberg as this monster. But there was one moment actually early in the match where the fan, like you said it, the fans are so into Sid here that they're actually cheering Sid above Goldberg. Mm. And Goldberg notices it. He gets some, like, some heavy, pretty heavy boom. Yeah. And there's one shot, and I don't know if you noticed it, where Goldberg cracks that smirk. And then he just fucking, he, he basically sits on top of Sid and just fucking levels the punches at him. And I was like, yeah. Goldberg got it. Yeah, yeah. Like, he understood yeah, no. to a level that I don't think people give him credit. Yeah. He's not somebody that was going to get pissy about the reaction he got. He's just like, I got a reaction. Mm-hmm. And he could feel the heat in the building. And he's just like, got you. To the point that I wonder, like, I know the ill-fated heel turn is summer 2000. Yeah. Like, I can understand why they thought that was a good idea. Yeah, this probably planted a seed to make you think, like, to give you the confidence that you could do something. Now, you probably could if the company wasn't in trouble and needing their top star to be a babyface and if he wasn't being booked by fucking morons. That is true. But, but <laughs> Like, you know, a lot of what ifs. But yeah, the, the context is, yeah, I can absolutely understand why the, him and the people booking the show would think... That there could be money in a, in a heel Goldberg run. Um, but yeah, now the finish with the Cobra Clutch and um, the referee stopping the match because Sid refused to say I quit and instead passed out. Again, it's yeah. it's Russo reusing one of his favorite finishes. Yeah. And look, I will say, I do when it's in the right spot, I love the passing out from the pain finish. Mm-hmm. Like obviously, Mania 13... But I remember in 2000 loving the the Jericho Benoit one when they did that. Mm-hmm. I think that was one of the biggest things that finally got Jericho over as a baby face when he passed out. Like, I can still remember, much like the Austin and the Sharpshooter, it's not as extreme or all-timer as that image or match. But I do remember, like, the clumps of Jericho's hair being stuck in Benoit's, like, in, in his grip. grip. Yeah, yeah. And him just fading The head's out, just like, kind of dropping down, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think a well-placed passing out and pain finish is fucking great. And like you said, this kind of, this, Sid lost, but got over more, like, as such a badass. Like, this guy doesn't give up. Like, he was, this match was stopped by the ref. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and not by him quitting. C- can we talk about, like, you, you brought up the Young Bucks there when we were talking about Scott Hall. Modern wrestlers can learn a fucking shit ton from Sid. Because Sid has now lost the last two pay-per-views in a row and come out the stronger for it. Because yeah. he has put everything into these fucking into this feud with Goldberg. I feel like both of these guys are guys that like modern wrestlers either shit on or don't feel they can learn something from because it's not a style that a lot of them try to emulate anymore. Um, which is such a mistake. Mm-hmm. It's such a mistake because now we're in an era where to be a good wrestler doesn't make you stand out no. anymore. Like you have to be exceptional to stand out. Like, look, we we watch AEW all the time. It's actually easier to come up with a list of who aren't excellent bell to bell wrestlers in that company than it is to come up with a list of who are who is there's like a hundred of the fuckers this, this, this is gonna sound insane ricochet just debuted in aw and what is usp yeah he's just a guy on this the roster thing, like because he's not and look he might get there but mm-hmm. like he he has been away for like six years in wwe six seven years and like in that time osprey has outpaced him like, if you're going to be an excellent belt-to-belt wrestler, you have to be someone on the level of a Danielson or an Osprey or an Omega to stand out as a great wrestler in the great wrestler company. Pac is in that company and doesn't get pushed. Yeah. Oh, you, like, go through. There's a laundry list of them. And, Do you know what I mean? Like Anyway, that, that that's fucking... That's another point. That's another point for another day. show. But, yeah. like, yeah, I think 
wrestlers, modern wrestlers could learn so much from just looking at how Sid has approached this feud. Looking at how stars protected their push without having to be so precious about wins and losses. Mm-hmm. Because this is the other thing. Like, you want to, like, I'll make one more AW comparison. You look at, like, what people have often said about someone like Miro doing that. That's not going to work for me, brother. As, like, I would say one of his, like, great moments that could have been parlayed into a fucking excellent gimmick was when he finally lost the TNT title because of his brittle neck. Yep. As, like, that, that, like, if you're somebody that doesn't mind taking losses to tell a story to get yourself more over there is a fascinating because this guy is a monster but he's got an Achilles heel well and if you can get in there I'm just gonna say who who in modern AEW has had the gimmick of they can't win a damn match and they're more over than ever yeah hangman yeah can't win the big one yeah and this is again like the other thing we often say when we talk about AEW the other thing that they do really well is like the the old grizzled vet that can't win a big one do you know what i mean Mm -hmm. like this gets you over like you know strength through adversity is a great story in professional wrestling and this again is like it's not quite what sid is doing here but it's sid eating a loss in a way that makes him stronger yep there's so many ways you can do it there's so many ways you can do it i think fundamentally people have gotten extremely lazy about what finishes can do to further your story and have gotten more obsessed with it. I do think wins and losses matter to a certain extent, depending on the story you tell. But I do feel there is a way you can tell a story where wins and losses matter, but not in a way where the guy who does the job loses out. Loses anything. Yeah, yeah. 100%. Um, yeah, like this feud has gone on for the guts of two and a half months, I want to say. Mm-hmm. And both guys come out of it in such a better position than they went into it because this is the thing yeah. people forget Goldberg was flailing as like yeah. Hulk Hogan's tag partner coming yep. into the fucking autumn mm-hmm. yep but uh, this again is one where Dave absolutely loses me half of one star no Matt, like I just, I just totally yeah. disagree yeah, like I'm not saying this is a four star match. No, it's not. But it it's not a fucking half a star match either. It's like a, it's a solid three star match. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, right. Okay. Uh, next up, we are heading towards the end of this show. Firstly, we have uh, Gene with Lex. Uh, he threatens Liz, saying he doesn't get mad, he gets even. She better watch her back. Great. More threats of man and woman violence. But this leads us into the heavyweight title tournament final match Brett versus Chris Benoit. Now, this is a 17 minute match. As you might imagine, it's a very technical match. Um, I'm not going to, with this type of match, there's no point in going move, 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 Mm -hmm. because there's lots of them happening at quite a fast pace. If you close your eyes and imagine a Benoit versus Bret Hart match, that is essentially the match you got. And much like you said earlier on with Sid and Goldberg, that's not a bad thing. Um, I think this is an excellently work match. I do think shocker for a WCW main event well overbooked there's two separate intermissions of people running out and getting involved in this match neither of which led directly to the finish and neither of which should have been like it, they weren't needed this match of all matches shouldn't have had any interference Um, you had the fan getting involved again who was then revealed to be Dean Malenko Mm -hmm. who tried to wipe his face his Canadian face paint off but ended up looking like a member of ICP in doing so Um, later on you had now Scott we should have known because Scott did say that Kevin was on his way and they were going to wreak havoc Uh, so Scott and Nash came out interfered again uh, Goldberg came out, speared Nash out of his boots, and then all three of them got kicked out. And I, one of the many things I hate about interference spots is like I hate interference that leads to a finish, but I also ha- hate interference at the same time that serves no purpose. 
So you had twice interference that did not in any way, like, because it was just interference and then they just wrestled for five more minutes, then interference and then they wrestled for about six more minutes after it. Like, why did we have to have Malenko interfering this match? Yeah, that was the that was the particularly pointless one because I get that the outsiders obviously have been feuding with Goldberg since the fucking year dot mm-hmm. and there's been outsiders and Brett stuff. You know, there has been like Yeah, which uh, like we we know where it goes now, but Yes. Yeah. They have they've been orbiting each other. So like in terms of who came out, I'm not saying it made completely no sense. I'm saying within the structure of the match it made no sense because it served no storytelling purpose mm-hmm. except to remind you that these two are in the orbit of the two that are um com- actually not even not even really with Benoit anymore, like just Brett that they're involved with and Goldberg comes out and obviously Goldberg and Brett, we know where that goes. Um anyway, uh, they get hauled up by security. Benoit's on top in the ring. Uh, we're coming towards the finish now. Brett fights, b- fights back. Big superplex for two. Germans from Benoit. A couple of reversals. Benoit attempts to crossface. Great scrappy reversal to avoid the crossface because he knew exactly what was going to happen. And then we get what people might recognize as the sharpshooter spot from the Malcolm in the Middle opening credits. Yep. <laughs> Burned into my brain from one watching wrestling and two from Malcolm in the Middle. Um, Benoit tops taps out, and this is the coronation that how it took them two years to get to this. It makes it even though Canada goes crazy. There's huge pyro. Brett's kids are in the ring. Brett and Benoit hug it out. He hoists the flag you're still left with the overwhelming impression is like, how the fuck did it take this long? Yeah. Yeah. And like, again, like you said, like you, you absolutely, you know, the, the, the drill tweet, you do not have to hand it to ISIS. But like you said, Russo, for whatever reason, obviously he always has ulterior self-serving motives, but one of the things he decided he was going to do was give Brett that moment that for some reason, Bischoff and Nash were just like, nah, man. Like, I'm sure, I'm sure I know for sure why Nash was like, nah. <laughs> but, like, Bischoff, it was just like, let's throw all this money in a fire. Yeah. It... And listen to Captain Handlebars. <laughs> yeah, it's that thing of, I don't want to credit Russo because how they got here was ultimately as convoluted as humanly possible to make it. Yeah, and this immediately also goes to shite. Yeah, oh, like it falls to fucking pieces like within at least fucking a week, I'd say, tops. But again, yeah. we won't see the Nitro and or we won't know what happens on Nitro until we've watched Thunder. Um, but all that said, I you kind of do have to say, you know what? He did do it. And that's something that nobody else in charge of WCW had done over the previous two years. Or was remotely fucking interested in doing. Like, but here's the thing. It's also 1999 Brett. And 1999 Brett is such a, like, rightly so. I'm not having a go at Brett here. He is such a broken down man, both personally and his investment in wrestling. It's just, oh my God, it just pisses me off so much that like, how do you not see Brett coming off Montreal and go, how can we immediately get this world title on him? Mm -hmm. I know we have to put it on Sting because we built a Sting for 18 months, but how do we not like immediately pivot to Brett while like he is the hottest character in wrestling not named Stone Cold Steve well, Austin I mean, right now. I mean, they almost got there because they stripped Sting instantly of the title. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. It's it's a good moment and it's, it's something that... It's nice for him to have, like, in this, like, literally worst year of his life that there's one moment where... Things were not shit for five minutes. And it was a good match as well. And it's nice that... It's, it's one of those nice moments in the last 18 months of WCW that there aren't that many of. Yeah. So if we just cling on to these. So I don't I don't want to be flick overly harsh about it. But yeah, it's yeah. just that sense of regret that it's two years too late. 
Mm. Uh, this got three and a quarter stars from Dave. About right. So, it wasn't as good as the Yeah, Mario about right. This is probably the closest to correct Dave was in the whole show for mm. me. Um, right, Lee. Mayhem 99 is in the books. Uh, please tell me your overall thoughts on the show and your winners and losers tonight. I thought the show was bookended by good matches. Um, the opener being my favourite match on the show. But everything in between varied from Goldberg, Sid, which was good, not great, down to David Flair, Kimberly, oddly enough, being the, you know, considering it was the match right before Sid Goldberg, but um, definitely being the worst segment slash match on the show. Um, mm-hmm. There was just so much crap in that mid card. Um, like you, you enjoyed Disco Heaven. I, I didn't enjoy Disco Heaven at I, all. Look, I, I, I want to hasten to say enjoy. I thought it was fun. No, but my point is, the first match was my favorite match on the show, and the main event was a good match. Everything in between, like up until Goldberg Sids, like for me was varying degrees of shit mostly. Yeah, shit. Like on the spectrum between forgettable and shit. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um. Look, Lex Luke package continues to be a comedy highlight and yeah i look forward to what we will see over the next month with package yeah but i won't ho- everything you'd be saying that? i won't hold my breath that it will continue to be good though yeah as soon as they overthink it this thing is done yeah. like so. so just enjoy it while it but lasts, hey we're on we're on road to starcade now we're on the road to Starcade. I'm sure nothing nothing infamous happens on that show anyway. <laughs> um, for tonight, the finish counter, brought to you by Ludwig Borger, has 12 matches with six clean finishes, five interference leading directly to a finish, and one complete non-finish via male-on-female violence. Um, thank you very much for listening to another episode of Days of Thunder. We'll be back in two weeks on the Voices of Wrestling feed with Thunder episode 90. In the meantime, you can cash us over largemanappears.com uh, with our talk and shop a mania uh, review and, and much more besides. Um, thank you very much for listening, and we'll see you again very soon. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone, for listening to another episode of Days of Thunder. Days of Thunder was produced by Lee Malone and edited by me, Dave Ryan. To keep up to date with the show and find all the ways to listen to us, you can follow us on Twitter at WCW Thunderpod or click the link tree link in our Twitter bio or in the show notes. I am at the day to Dave on Twitter and Lee is at Malone underscore 713. Days of Thunder is a part of the Voices of Wrestling podcast network. Follow the VOW network anywhere. Good podcasts are sold for more fine podcasts than you can shake a stick at. Thanks. Hey everybody, my name is Jesse Collings, and I want to tell you all about my show, The Gentleman's Wrestling Podcast, here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. On The Gentleman's Wrestling Podcast, we do a thorough analysis on the biggest issues and trends within the pro wrestling industry. We talk a lot about pro wrestling media, we talk a lot about fan culture, and wrestling's place within general pop culture, and we talk about the broader influences that are shaping the way we discuss and analyze the pro wrestling industry. We've had some of the brightest minds in the pro wrestling intelligentsia on the show, including WrestleNomics host Brandon Thurston, both Rich Critch and Joe Lanza from the Flagship Wrestling Podcast, Trevor Dame from the Through the Years Podcast, and a whole lot more. This isn't a show for hot takes, It's not a show recapping the latest episode of television. 
This is a show focusing on the biggest topics in pro wrestling and doing a deep dive on the real stories behind the surface level analysis you might find elsewhere. The Gentleman's Wrestling Podcast is available wherever you get your podcasts, and we'd really appreciate it if you gave us a try. Thanks.